Major funding for Benjamin Franklin is provided by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. The people of Northwestern Mutual are proud to have supported this remarkable series on PBS, celebrating the wisdom and ingenuity of one of America's most distinguished founding fathers. Major funding is also provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Pew Charitable Trusts, investing in ideas, returning results. Additional funding is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for Public Understanding of Science and Technology, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, by these funders, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. I'd already shown that an electrical stroke could melt small quantities of metal. Previously, we had struck a pigeon dead using only electricity. The experiment today was to see whether electricity could kill an animal as large as a turkey. We knew the shock would have to be very great. Everyone in the room was excited, talking to me and to each other, and stupidly, I forgot I was holding the conductor connected to the negative pole of the battery. I'm a trifle ashamed of this blunder. A bigger charge and I might not be talking to you now. It certainly would have been the easiest of all deaths. Franklin is a wonderful example of a very powerful mind with a very powerful curiosity, immense gifts, and considerable flaws in action. He presented to the world a face of folksy charm, but beneath this surface lay the fire of enormous ambition. The range of Benjamin Franklin's achievements is astonishing. The inventor who saved the world from the terrors of lightning and the diplomat who rescued the American Revolution is also the author of one of the most widely reprinted books since the Bible. Franklin would relish the communication and digital revolution we're going through today. And I'm sure he would have been one of the first people in America to have created a website and then also probably created an online service so he could make money off of the website. Because he loved the idea of spreading information, thoughts, discourse. He is the touchstone for, for every single pivotal point in early American history. His signature on the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty with France, Constitution, is symbolic of Franklin's impact on American history. He signed the documents, but, but he was the documents. He basically was a down-to-earth, pragmatic person, somebody who not always practiced what he preached, but always had the uh, detachment and sense of irony to know his true soul. And understanding Franklin's soul is sort of understanding the soul of America. It is the inclination of old men to talk about themselves and their deeds. But just because I'm old, don't feel you owe me any respect. You can listen or not as you please. I confess right off, because if I deny it, you won't believe me, that another reason I'm talking about myself is to gratify my own vanity. <laughs> By the way, have you ever noticed when someone is making a speech which they introduce with the words, without vanity, I may say, they always say something very vain about themselves right afterwards. 
Some people think vanity is an evil. I don't. I think vanity is one of the great comforts of life. <laughs> I've had a very happy life, so much so that I'd have no objection to living it all over again. <laughs> well, perhaps I'd correct a few errors I made the first time round. But since repetition isn't possible, the next best thing is to remember that life and to relate it to you. Benjamin Franklin was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1706. Only 15 years earlier, all New England had been consumed by the Salem witch trials. This is a world where witches are real and they are doing the work of the devil. Man has very little ability to control cosmic forces or even understand how the natural world works. If lightning did damage, it w would be conceived of as an affliction, an affliction that one had earned. If the almighty God should from heaven rain down upon Boston a horrible tempest of thunderbolts, it would be no more than our unrepented sins deserve. Mankind is at the mercy of an all-powerful God. People have little control over their fate and must passively accept their lot. When lightning hits a house, causing it to catch fire, the fire brigade extinguishes the fire only in the adjoining houses, but lets that house burn to the ground. They see it as the will of God. Devils, unseen forces, and God's vengeance. This is the world into which Benjamin Franklin is born. My father, Josiah Franklin, married young and came with his wife to Boston in 1682 to escape religious persecution in England. Here he had four more children by his first wife, and after she died, ten more by a second wife, my mother, Abiah Folger. In all, Josiah had 17 children. I am the youngest son, born in Boston in 1706. Franklin will later make much of his rise to prominence from humble beginnings. His father is a tradesman, a candle and soap maker. This is not a world of privilege, far from it. Josiah is a proud, devoutly religious man. He instills in his son the Puritan idea that you have no real control over your destiny. From birth, some have been chosen to go to heaven, and some will burn in the eternal damnation of hell. As a matter of fact, Clint Eastwood in The Unforgiven gives the uh, essence of Calvinist Puritanism in one sentence. When he kills a man uh, who says that he doesn't deserve to die, and he says deserving has nothing to do with it. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that's Calvinism in a nutshell. Josiah decides to send the young Franklin to school to be educated as a minister. He was raised in a religious family. His uncle gave him a gift of a, a multi-volume set of sermons, as he said, presuming that young Ben might set, set up stock as a preacher in Boston, being educated as a minister means that he is being prepared to be a leader in society. The most powerful and influential clergyman in New England is Cotton Mather. Young Franklin is fascinated by his sermons, which take the most commonplace events of daily life and draw out their moral lessons. I was emptying the cistern of nature, making water on a wall when a dog came up beside me and did the same thing. I thought to myself, how mean and vile is our mortal state, our natural necessities placing us on the same level as dogs? 
From that moment on, I resolved that every time I answered the call of nature, I would evoke some divine thought that would rise up and soar to the angels. Virtually every aspect of Puritanism was accentuated in Cotton Mather. Uh, his Puritanism was to the tenth power. Among his uh, reminders to himself is not to enter or leave a room without doing some good in it. This, for Mather, is one of the central tenets of Puritanism. You glorify God by doing good for your fellow man. Franklin was early on thrilled with the possibility that he would become his generation's Cotton Mather. In his old age, Franklin will vividly remember a visit to Cotton Mather and a moral lesson learned. He was showing me out of the house, and there was a very low beam near the doorway. I was still talking when he began shouting, Stoop! Stoop! I didn't understand what he meant and banged my head on the beam. <laughs> You're young, he said, and have the world before you. Stoop as you go through it, and you'll avoid many hard thumps. <laughs> that advice has been very useful to me. I've avoided many misfortunes by not carrying my head too high in pride. Franklin, from the get-go, understood that he was a modest man's son, but he had powers that rich men's sons didn't have. He was smarter than they were, he was more adroit than they were, he was stronger than they were. In school, Franklin soars to the head of his class. He is promoted and immediately rises up in his next class as well. He is beginning to suffer from the Puritan sin of vanity. Benjamin's getting snide, he's getting uppity, he's getting impatient with stupid people. At 10 years old, I was taken out of school to assist my father in his business, making soap and candles, cutting wicks, filling the dipping molds, attending the shop, running errands. I hated that trade and had a hankering for the sea. But my father wouldn't allow it. However, Living near the water, I was much in it and about it. I taught myself to swim. It's easy to get caught up with Franklin on the, on the $100 bill, uh, Franklin in the Duplessis portrait, Franklin in Peel's portraits. He is always the elder statesman. It's easy to forget that he had hair once, uh, that he was a little kid passionately fond of swimming. He became an excellent swimmer. He was tall and broad-shouldered and uh, athletic-looking and uh, active. Few people knew how to swim in the 18th century. As a youth, Franklin has to learn by reading a book by the French author Thévenot. He looked at the drawings that Tevno had made of, I think, 40 different positions in swimming, and he practiced them all, one by one by one. He mastered them, and as he adds in the autobiography, he added a few of his own. I was flying a paper kite while swimming in a pond. I found that floating on my back and holding the string, I was pulled across the pond without the least fatigue and with the greatest pleasure imaginable. He's in a most difficult position. He's brighter even than he knows. And his intelligence has to find an outlet that it cannot find. Although he's been denied further schooling, Benjamin is sure of one thing. He's not going to spend the rest of his life as a candle maker. He resists so strongly that Josiah finally decides to apprentice young Franklin to his older brother James, a printer. He persuaded me to sign the indentures and serve as an apprentice until I was 21. I was only 12 years old at the time. He continues rebelling once he's been made a printer. He still thinks of himself as the kid who was on his way 
to the college. So when everyone in James Franklin's printing shop gets together for lunch, Benjamin excuses himself. And after eating a quick meal, he studies in private. In the print shop, he has access to a rich assortment of books, very different from Cotton Mather's religious tracts. When he discovered these books, he just ate them up. They're not talking about religious consciousness. They're not talking about who's saved and who's not saved. Gave him a glimpse of, of something other than the world he was living in. He begins a methodical program of self-education, learning everything from geometry to the art of winning arguments using the Socratic method. When he decides he's got to perfect his own writing style, he disassembles the books in front of himself word by word and then rewrites them. It was an extraordinary uh, intensity of effort that just is uh, awesome. He would make little notes on pieces of paper, the, the theme of a paragraph or the various points in the thing. He would put it aside for a while, come back and then try to compose it. In a few cases, he thought he even made a slight improvement over these masters of English writing. His brother James publishes one of the first newspapers in America, the New England Current. Much of the content of this paper appears in the form of fictitious letters to the editor, adopting different personae, but actually written by James Franklin and his friends. He also begins to receive a number of papers signed Silent Do Good, an obvious pseudonym. The letters are written by the printer's apprentice himself. Benjamin Franklin. He had to write under another name because his elder brother James didn't want Ben getting involved in the newspaper. Young Benjamin assumes the role of a middle-aged widow with progressive ideas and strong opinions on every aspect of life. Name a vice in which women exceed men. Drunkenness, swearing, and idleness. If you talk to us, you'll learn that a woman's work is never done. As for ignorance, that's completely the fault of men who prevent women from getting an education. Women are taught to read and write their names and nothing else. We have the God-given capacity for knowledge and understanding. What have we done to forfeit the privilege of being taught? Franklin got the tone of these letters, the pitch of this woman's voice, just perfect. Now here's a 16-year-old boy putting himself in the voice in the position of a middle-aged widow and pulling it off. It's absolutely remarkable. And that's what convinced me that Franklin is a genius. Silence Do Good's letters, 14 in all, appear in the current over a period of six months. James, and indeed all of Boston, is beginning to wonder who this Silence Do Good really is. 16-year-old Benjamin Franklin can hardly contain himself. And when he does say these papers that you've been praising so heavily, and which are, after all, very good, uh, these papers are mine, that doesn't help relations with the brother, the master, who's also supposed to be governing him. Benjamin was smarter than James, was better as a printer, even as an apprentice, than James was. James would beat him, as masters commonly beat their apprentices. Well, Ben didn't think this was right. In his 17th year, Benjamin Franklin breaks his apprenticeship agreement. He steals himself from his brother. Franklin is now a runaway. He has no idea what will happen next, but he is confident, intelligent, and he has a trade. His life in the next two years reads like a novel by Dickens. Escapades, mishaps, embarrassments, and conquests. He travels to New York, and then to Philadelphia, where he works for several months as a printer. In Philadelphia, a wealthy man, impressed with Franklin's abilities, offers him an opportunity to go to London, and the young printer jumps at the chance. In England, he will encounter a world that will transform his life. He falls in love with London. 
Everybody knew everybody in Boston. The big city, you lose yourself, free from any kind of parental or, or master control, and uh, uh, he, it's a pretty freewheeling time for him. He sold wild oats with wild abandon. He met women of all kinds. As he said later, he was always very lucky. He didn't catch any dreadful disease. He is awake and alert. Already quite knowing about the variety of human characters. He's 18 when he comes to London, and willy-nilly in important respects naive. But he is a quick learner. Franklin survives in London by working as a pressman and typesetter in one of the city's many print shops. In this publishing world, he meets the notorious Bernard Mandeville, author of Private Vices, Public Benefits. He's enchanted with Mandeville's idea that there is no moral difference between good and evil. Franklin evolves philosophies which will let him get away with anything, that God couldn't possibly object to evil, God couldn't possibly object to pleasure, uh, because everything that comes to us comes to us from God, because God created everything. He writes a little pamphlet, which he publishes, without his name on it in 1725. He's freed himself from one of the most serious constraints operating in the Boston of his day, and that is he defines his religion radically differently than that of his family's religion. Franklin feels at home in London's flourishing coffeehouse culture, where new and radical ideas are hotly debated. England is in the full throes of a revolution of human thought, a revolution called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a new way of looking at the world that suggested that rational thought and planning could lead to change. It's a reduction of the importance of religion in, in life and a much greater emphasis on the here and now and on the improvement of people's lives. This revolution in human thought allows people to examine all aspects of existence, including the accepted belief that one's station in life is fixed and unchanging. The basic assumption of the Enlightenment is that we're not born to be what we are, which was the traditional view for centuries, for eons. And once you have that insight, which is a modern insight, you, you can begin to change things. You, education becomes important. You can change what you were born, presumably born to be. You could become something else. These new and revolutionary ideas, Benjamin Franklin has taken it all in. Now 20, he sets sail back to Philadelphia. He will spend the long journey home working out the lessons, good and bad, learned during his stay in England. This was going to be a new chapter in Benjamin's life. He felt a certain nostalgia for London, which had pleased him so much, and perhaps a little apprehension of the future. September 23rd, 1726. Two months at sea. For all we know, like Noah and his company in the ark, we may be the only surviving remnant of the human race. Philosophers write a lot of fine words on the pleasures of solitude. But man is a sociable animal. And one of the greatest punishments is to be excluded from society. He's beginning to have second thoughts about whether one can live alone whether one can be an island sufficient unto oneself. He's been really irresponsible. He's been really having a great time in London. Never put anything aside. 
Uh, the only reason he's able to come back is that some Philadelphia merchant is paying his way. It's beginning to dawn on him that this isn't quite the way to live. Franklin becomes fiercely determined to change the direction of his life. Those who teach the art of writing tell us that we must always begin with a plan, an outline of the whole piece. Otherwise, the essay will turn out incoherent. I've never had a regular design in my life, so up to now it's been a confused variety of different scenes. I must make resolutions, some plan of action. From this moment on, I intend to live my life as a rational creature. He had a great need to put his life in order at that moment. One could almost say he wanted to become a good boy, a good, serious, steady boy. One, I will be extremely frugal until I have paid all my debts as systematically as he has cultivated his mind as a teenager, he now wants to cultivate his emotions. Two, I will apply myself industriously to business. I will not divert my mind with any foolish schemes of growing suddenly rich. Industry and patience are the surest means to plenty. Franklin arrives in Philadelphia in 1726. After the great metropolis of London, this town of 4,000 with dirt streets and wooden houses seems like a tiny country village. It is here he will start his life over again. His story is, of course, spectacular. The youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back, as he says, uh, in a world where primogeniture and patriarchy were, were valued, uh, he, he, he sees himself as, as at the lowest rung of the ladder, and he's, he's intent on moving up. Benjamin Franklin was in a very difficult position if he thought he was going to rise as a tradesman within the patriarchal structures that existed. In this world of family connections and patronage, Franklin is an outsider. He realizes that he can never succeed on his own. When he comes back to Philadelphia, he really launches on a new resolve, which is this new morality that is going to overthrow the sense of unbridled self-interest, and which is going to, to suggest instead that people will do better working together, living together, he recruits blacksmiths, shoemakers, shopkeepers, ambitious tradesmen like himself, and forms a club which he calls the Junto. Franklin's formation of the Junto is the mother of all self-help associations. These are young men on the make. They need connections. Today we would call it networking. Part secret society, part discussion group, part rotary club, the Junto meets in a tavern every Friday night. Standing questions for the Junto. Do you know any rich people? Do you know how they got rich? Has anyone's business failed? Do you know why? Do you know of any fellow citizen who's done some worthy action deserving our praise? Someone who's committed an error for us to avoid. Do you have any projects the Junto can help you with? They have debates, they have speaking exercises where they critique each other, not just for the ideas, but for the presentation, for the delivery, so that they're learning a certain polish. They're learning to, to talk like sophisticated businessmen. Franklin is now able to borrow money. And two years after his return to Philadelphia, he opens up a print shop. Now an independent businessman, he soon realizes that it will take more than hard work to get ahead in the world. 
Franklin discovers that the very modern idea of image is crucial to his success. In order to build my credit and character as a tradesman, I take care not only in reality to be industrious and frugal, but to appear so in public. When I buy paper, I make sure to be seen pushing it through the streets in a wheelbarrow. I'm soon considered an industrious and thriving young man, and merchants who import books or stationery choose me to sell them in my shop. Everything goes swimmingly. The tennis player, uh, Andre Agassi, said image is everything. Franklin is always in control of how he looks to other people. It would have been characteristic of Franklin at the time to make sure he hadn't oiled that wheelbarrow's wheel so that he squeaked through the streets and attracted attention. My thoughts now turn to marriage. A single man is like half a scissors, an incomplete human being. Of course, it was a great day for Ben Franklin, probably a great day for Philadelphia, because that's the day that he saw the woman that he would one day take to wife, Deborah Reed. The story has become part of the Franklin myth. In 1723, when he first ran away from Boston to Philadelphia at the age of 17, Franklin was a young man fresh off the boat, walking down Market Street with two loaves of bread stuffed under his arms and one being stuffed into his mouth. He actually sees a woman standing on the stoop, and she very much remembers seeing him because she thought it was very funny. Now, seven years later, he and Deborah agree to get married. Franklin has good reason to want to settle down. He has been having affairs with what he calls low women and now finds himself the father of a baby boy. Deborah becomes mother to his son, William, and together they will have two children, a son who dies young and a daughter, Sally. Deborah proves to be an excellent helpmate. She runs the shop and is a shrewd businesswoman. Franklin's success in Philadelphia is due in part to his practical selection of a very practical wife. Of their Chloe's and Phyllis's poets may prate, I sing of my plain country Joan. Some faults have we all, and so has my Joan. But then, they're exceedingly small. And now I'm grown used to them, so, like my own, I scarcely can see them at all. Franklin now takes over a failing newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. He becomes not only its printer, but its publisher, editor, and chief writer. From the first issue, Franklin transforms the Gazette, livening it up with local news and a touch of sensationalism. He puts his stories in the voices of fictitious reporters. A butcher had a dream that he was killing a calf. When he woke up, he discovered to his horror that he was actually slicing his child in two. And he would often make up stories. He would relate gossip. He would sometimes relate as true gossip things that he had simply made up. In Bucks County, we hear that a flash of lightning came so near a lad as to melt the pewter buttons off his breeches. Lad considers himself lucky that nothing else in that site was made of pewter. He recognized in a way that Rupert Murdoch today might appreciate that selling news was also selling entertainment. The Pennsylvania Gazette also prints serious articles on a variety of subjects. Franklin, who had grown up in the oppressive uniformity of Boston, passionately believes that a free press will encourage ordinary people to begin thinking for themselves. And certainly the Pennsylvania Gazette is a profitable paper because it exposes all sides to an issue. And sometimes it would be Franklin himself writing a letter under one pen name on one side of the issue and then the next week writing another letter under another pen name on another side of the issue. And it was good for business, but I think it was also, Franklin thought, good for getting the truth out. Franklin also begins printing a yearly almanac, the 18th century equivalent of a date book. In the day columns for which there are no entries, he squeezes in little aphorisms. Soon, people from all walks of life are repeating them. He who lies down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. Some are funny, some serious, 
all memorable. The greatest monarch on the proudest throne is still obliged to sit on his own arse. The way to be safe is never to feel secure. Once again, he's encouraging people to examine the world around them. Franklin is delivering something that's related to the sermon. Franklin is always, almost always trying to inculcate a lesson that will lead to improvement. How many observe Christ's birthday? How few his teachings? It's much easier to keep the holidays than the commandments. He loves to tweak. He loves to insinuate. He loves to grab you and surprise you. Fish and house guests stink after three days. Love your neighbor, but don't pull down your hedge. Poor Richard is the ordinary man's philosopher, how to get along in the everyday world. He is the spokesman for sense that is genuinely common. Creditors have better memories than debtors. Franklin later collects poor Richard's aphorisms on money and frugality and puts them in a book which he calls The Way to Wealth. Translated into many languages during his lifetime, the book has never been out of print. If you want to know the value of money, go try and borrow some. Franklin uses the profits from his successful publishing ventures to acquire real estate and set up partnerships with print shops all through the colonies. By the time he's 35, this once penniless printer's apprentice has become one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia. God helps them who help themselves. Everyone associates Franklin with getting rich. That for Franklin, getting rich is an end in itself. Nothing could be further from the truth. To be really successful in a Franklinian sense, if you read what he writes very carefully, is not to be wealthy and, and to uh, be conspicuously wealthy, to live in a big house, to eat off good china, to uh, wear fancy clothes that the sign of success was in your capacity to give back to the community. And that it was in serving that one achieved felicity. Where did the sense of obligation come from? I think there may well be Protestant and maybe even Puritan origins here. Remembering the lessons of his youth, Franklin now turns his considerable energy to doing good to improving life in Philadelphia. The country town of 4,000 has become a city, overflowing with 20,000 inhabitants. There are animals everywhere. Housewives turn their hogs out in the street to feed on garbage. Backyard outhouses overflow when it rains. The smell and the flies are terrible. As Philadelphia continues to grow, so do its problems. I propose for the city I love an effective way of cleaning its streets. Some may think that this is a matter of small importance, that it is not worth considering the dust blown into the eyes of a single person in a single shop on a windy morning. But in a populous city, this happens all the time. Human happiness comes not from infrequent pieces of good fortune, but from these small improvements to daily life. He's got, at some level, ideas that he's convinced are better than anybody else's. And he wants to see those ideas implemented. The trick is how to do that when you're not king. You're not an earl and you're not a duke, but you are a common citizen in the colony. Franklin and the Junto use their collective power to solve common problems. They form a volunteer fire department and convince tradesmen to pool their resources, setting up the library company, the first lending library in America. Not the rugged individual, but a group of people sensing a social need can band together, not depending on the government, but taking the situation in hand and exerting whatever ingenuity and whatever strength they have to achieve what they think needs to be done and I think Franklin did that on a scale that nobody in the world had ever dreamed before. 
the genius is social. And the voluntary association is Franklin's invention. And it's what builds America. Working through these associations, he helps establish the Pennsylvania Hospital. He founds a college, which is to become the University of Pennsylvania. He proposes America's first organization to exchange scientific knowledge, the American Philosophical Society. The voluntary associations also devote their energies to down-to-earth projects, like paving and lighting the streets of Philadelphia. He wanted to make life here and now more comfortable for ordinary human beings. And that is new in the world. I mean, people had lived for thousands of years without really worrying about ordinary people. That's the enlightenment for Franklin, I think. The scriptures assure me that on the last day we shall not be examined on what we believed, but on what we did. Our entrance to heaven will not be because we kneeled and said, Lord, Lord, but because we did some good for our fellow creatures. Franklin was a unique person. He was too smart in too many areas. He was modern in a world that wasn't yet totally modern, so that he really was set apart from other people. And I think it would be interesting to look at Franklin's character as a study in how a man finds himself, uh, in essence, solitary, alone, different from other people, and finds ways to establish connections with them. They're not intimate connections, they're organizational connections, they're political connections. They're sort of a hail fellow, well met connections. He certainly never found an intellectual soulmate among the men that he knew, and he settles for the kinds of relationships that he can find. All through his life, Franklin never saw a problem that he didn't try to solve. Frustrated by inefficient fireplaces, he tinkers with a stove that gives off more heat using less fuel. He takes over the inefficient colonial postal system and speeds up the delivery of letters. And for the first time in its history, the post office makes a profit. He looks into the problem of defense on the frontiers and suggests a radical plan for an intercolonial union, illustrated by this cartoon. He tries to perfect tripless candles and invents a simplified clock that needs only three wheels. He wonders about the movement of storms and the social behavior of ants. A lot of people who think carefully about one aspect of life or another, or one public service or another, devote serious attention to those problems or that particular chore, and then relax for a while, recharge their batteries. Franklin apparently didn't need to do that. He'd go from one public problem to a mathematical problem. Franklin's rest, for instance, if he were waiting outside the door to be admitted to an assembly room, would be to do a very complicated mathematical problem or to think about an invention, how to perfect a man-made object. Franklin didn't really rest in the conventional sense between chores. His mind was simply too active. At the age of 42, Franklin decides to make a radical change in his life. He will retire from the day-to-day -day operations of the print shop. To celebrate this event, the artist Robert Feek paints this elegant full-length portrait. Benjamin Franklin Printer has transformed himself into Benjamin Franklin, gentleman of leisure. He will now have time to pursue the true passion of his life, Science. Science in the 18th century, natural philosophy as they called it, was made up of a number of amateurs. Enlightened, distinguished, and extremely curious amateurs 
who had to make their own tools for the experiments. And Franklin was absolutely at ease in that world. That was the world in which he could thrive. Franklin's curious mind now becomes intrigued by one of the great scientific mysteries of the 18th century, the phenomenon of electricity. Never in my life has anything so totally engrossed me. While I was making experiments and then repeating them for my friends and acquaintances who come in crowds to see them, I don't have a moment for anything else. In Franklin's day, electricity was much more of a puzzle than gravity had been a century earlier in Newton's time. Everybody was familiar with things falling and all, but electricity it was just a matter of rubbing something and getting some sparks. Where did this come from? Very mysterious. For Franklin, the pursuit of electricity started as a game. There was an itinerant Englishman who went from town to town showing gadgets that produced scintillas and sparks and could do things. In one popular demonstration, a group of people hold hands and then receive a collective shock from an electrostatic generator. This game is performed by people around the world. With the kind of mind and the curiosity he had, Franklin wanted to go beyond the amusement. The great thing about every one of these parlor tricks the simple phenomena of attraction, repulsion, was why. Before Franklin, no one had any clue. Franklin puzzles over electricity for almost 10 years. Why is a stream of water attracted to a charged glass rod? Can you kill an animal with an electric shock? At the time, everyone assumed that electricity was some mysterious force created by rubbing two different substances together. Through experimentation, Franklin proves that in fact, the friction does not create electricity, it simply moves a charge from one body to another. When these charged bodies are brought close together, the result is a spark. Electricity flowing through the air. This theory was based on the concept of an electric fluid, like an electric current, and that this could exist in bodies in a surplus or a deficiency. He called one state plus or positive and the other minus or negative. Before Franklin, people had no idea what electricity was or how it worked. After Franklin's fundamental insight, the phenomenon of electricity could be understood and harnessed as a force to change the world. The way Franklin pursued science is totally modern, but we have to understand in his day, it was the exception. But he would always emphasize that it was exploration. Nature had things out there waiting for you to find them out. You know that what you will understand tomorrow is greater than today. And you know that because the truth waits patiently for you. Both give off light of the same color and have a crooked direction. Lightning and this discharge both give off a noise like a crack and both are conducted by metals. The electricity generated in the laboratory is attracted to a pointed metal rod. Since they are similar in every other way, will lightning too be attracted to an iron rod let the experiment be made. In the previous century, Newton drew a connection between the motion of the moon and a falling apple. In his century, a century later, Franklin drew the connection between sparks in his laboratory 
and lightning bolts in the sky. Franklin hits on a method to prove experimentally that lightning and the sparks in his laboratory are exactly the same. They only differ in scale. The events of this fateful day are described by his close friend and fellow scientist, Joseph Priestley. Secretly, because he was afraid of being made fun of and with only his son as a witness, he raised a kite into an oncoming storm. Fixed upon it, there was a pointed wire which was to draw the lightning from the clouds. They were in the storm for a considerable amount of time with nothing happening. Then, just as he was about to give up, he put his knuckle to the key and felt a definite electric spark. Can you imagine his excitement? The exquisite pleasure of that moment. He transferred the charge from the key to the electric jars. The jars could then be used to perform the same electrical experiments as if they had been charged by rubbing a glass in the laboratory. The sameness of the electrical matter with that of lightning had been proven. Knowing this about electricity, Franklin asks himself one more question. How can this knowledge serve humanity? It has pleased God in his goodness to mankind to finally show them a way of protecting their buildings from the mischief of thunder and lightning. Take a small iron rod with one end buried three feet. In his almanac of 1753, Franklin reveals the details of his invention. A rod of iron placed on the roof of a building can safely discharge a bolt of lightning down a wire connected into the ground. He doesn't patent the lightning rod. It will be his gift to the world. The ordinary lightning rod, the Franklin rod, is still the basis of the lightning protection code in every single country in the world. It's still today the best way to protect an ordinary house or a structure from lightning damage. Calming the ogre of lightning, this frightening thing, this had a huge impact on the public imagination. There was an episode, for example, with two ships side by side. One had a lightning rod and one didn't. It was both struck by lightning, one destroyed completely. The one with lightning rod, perfectly fine. First, the clergy felt that he was usurping a prerogative of the Almighty. Franklin said, well, we do not hesitate to protect ourselves from the hail of heaven with roofs and shields, but we should be entitled to do the same with lightning. In an age of reason, his proof that the lightning discharge is an ordinary natural phenomenon and not a manifestation of the powers of darkness or the force of an angry god was seen as a tremendous blow for reason against superstition. In 1753, Franklin is awarded the Copley Medal the 18th century equivalent of the Nobel Prize for science. This once runaway printer's apprentice is now the most famous American in the world. Benjamin Franklin is 47 years old, by 18th century standards, an old man. His contributions to science were remarkable, but if he could look into his future, he would be astounded. In truth, his life's work has just begun. Learning is valuable, but on the day of judgment, we'll not be asked whether we have learned languages or philosophy or even the proper name of every star. The sun and moon will have vanished. The constellations themselves will have disappeared along with all of nature. But our deeds 
our good and bad works shall remain forever, recorded in the archives of eternity. Benjamin Franklin is remembered today as the great inventor, the man who protected the world from the terrors of lightning. He is also remembered as one of America's founding fathers. But this leaves out much of his story. That this future revolutionary was in fact a very wealthy man with aristocratic aspirations. That for much of his life, he considered himself more an Englishman than an American. It would take Franklin a long time to give up his attachment to England. When he finally did side with the cause of independence, it would bring about the greatest personal tragedy of his life. To Catherine Ray, be gone business for the next hour, and let me chat a little with my Katie. You asked me in your last letter if everyone loves me as you do. Well, I must confess, that, don't be jealous, that many more people love me than ever before. Since I last saw you, I've done some things for the province for which people thank me and praise me, and now they love me. Or at least they say they love me, like you used to do. But I'm sure if I asked them for any real favors, they would, like you, as readily refuse me. So what's the real advantage of being loved? In the winter of 1755, while visiting his relations in Boston, Franklin meets a very beautiful young woman, Catherine Ray. He happily agrees to accompany her on the trip home, she to Rhode Island, he back to Philadelphia and his wife and children. Franklin will see Catherine Ray in person only three more times, but they will continue to correspond all the rest of his long life. Your absence from me increases rather than lessens my affections for you. Tell me you're well and that you love me one thousandth as much as I love you, then I'll be content. It is a classic situation. A man nearly 50, at the height of his scientific fame, basking in his newly discovered powers to impress and charm a girl half his age. She, in turn, glories in the impact that she's making on this famous man. I am sending you some sugared plums made with my own hands, each one sweetened just as you used to like. Katie. Dear, dear Katie, your plums have arrived safe and were sweet, not only from the sugar, but from the touch of your dear hands. Mrs. Franklin enjoyed them as well. Your letters of affection compel me to give you a little fatherly arithmetic lesson. Find yourself a good husband, then you must practice addition of his money by minding the household finances, subtract all unnecessary expenses, and have no divisions between you. Multiplication, ah, oh, yes, I'd have happily taught you multiplication myself, but you refuse to learn. She uh, and he carried on the most fascinating flirtation for years. And uh, Franklin claimed that he was trying to seduce her and, uh, uh, and that she toyed with him and uh, so forth. But I, I honestly don't believe anything ever came of it. It was a game that he loved to play with women. With Catherine Ray, as with other young women, Franklin will act the role of father figure, teacher, and flirt. His attraction to young women and theirs to him has given Franklin a reputation as a womanizer. There is no evidence that his playful words ever led to anything more serious, but he is to enjoy the charm 
and respect the intelligence of women throughout his long life. Adieu, dear good girl. Alas, I may be going to England for some time. I just couldn't leave without writing you. A new phase in Franklin's life is about to begin. The colony of Pennsylvania is sending him to England on official business. Franklin has been to London as a young man and is eager to return. He is outgrowing America. The Franklin who went to England at age 51 is both the same Franklin who went to England at age 18 and an altogether different man. He's, of course, older. He's wiser. He's a public figure in many countries. The kite, that blasted kite with its key, made him a celebrity. He knew who he was. Franklin had wanted to bring his whole family with him to London, but his wife, Deborah, is terrified of ocean travel and refuses to come. She stays in Philadelphia with their daughter, Sally. The one family member Franklin insists accompany him to England is his beloved son, William. The father had always involved William in his many projects. Uh, whether it was on science experiments or in the post office or in the legislature or on the frontier, um, they were inseparable. Too close, I think. In the summer of 1757, Franklin and son arrive in London. Now 27 years old, William Franklin is handsome, bright, and eager for new adventures. As a young colonial from a distant outpost of the British Empire, William is overwhelmed. From the moment I arrived in this great metropolis, all my attention was consumed with the noise and bustle of the streets and the infinite variety of new sights. And now there are the appointments with politicians and philosophers. Father and son rent four rooms on Craven Street. It is in the center of London, a short walk from the clubs and coffee houses, the offices of government, the theaters, and busy streets of London's dazzling nightlife. Samuel Johnson celebrated, Lee said, he who's tired of London is tired of life. London was the center of much that made being human uh, exciting, and that was for Franklin a magnet. Uh, he reveled in London society, and he had a running account with a wine merchant up the street. Uh, he joined 60 different eating clubs, so that he never had to, to cook a meal or stay home for one. He rented a coach. He thought about having his coat of arms put on the door of it. He went around with William, tracing their ancestral roots, their genealogy. Uh, he was an entirely different Franklin in England from the, the uh, poor, simple uh, Benjamin of Philadelphia. He bought the right wigs. He bought the right clothes. He knew when you go to England that you must play the part of a gentleman or you will get absolutely nowhere. And so he fit right into London society just as much as his son did. Franklin has been sent to England by the Pennsylvania Assembly on a mission of crucial importance to the colony. In the previous century, the entire province had been granted by the king to William Penn, and the Penn family still controls three quarters of the immense colony. Unlike everyone else who owns land in Pennsylvania, they pay not a penny in taxes. They thought the colony's government pretty much existed to secure the revenues of the Penn family. For Franklin, that was essentially feudalism, and he despised that, the idea that a, a moneyed family in Great Britain would use a colony strictly as a source of revenue for its lifestyle. Franklin's mission is to try and force Thomas Penn, son of the founder, to begin paying taxes. It is one thing to have an important reputation as a scientist. It is quite another to have any real influence in the genteel world of imperial politics. Mr. Franklin's fame means nothing here. His playing with electricity is only of interest to a particular set of people.
Few men of any consequence have even heard of him. The important people, the ones who are to decide the dispute between us, are all friends of mine. The meeting between Thomas Penn and Franklin takes place in January of 1758. Penn begins on the offensive, denying the fact that the assembly has any right to tax him. In fact, that it has any rights at all. I answered that according to his father's charter, which founded Pennsylvania, and then I quoted it to him, the assembly of Pennsylvania shall have all the power and privileges of any assembly formed by freeborn subjects of England. Aha, he says. But my father didn't have any authority from the crown to grant this right. And then he laughs, snorting <coughs> like a donkey. I was astounded. He's a vile liar. That's not what I said or did. The rights of freeborn Englishmen. <laughs> the Germans settled Pennsylvania because there was good farmland there. They'd never even heard of my father's charter. In any case, it's over. I'll have no further conversations for any reason whatsoever with this tribune of the people. Thomas is enraged. When I meet him anywhere, he looks at me with a strange mixture of hatred, anger, fear, and vexation. <laughs> I've absolutely no regrets for calling him a swindler. That description is completely justified. I hope it sticks in his liver. Franklin was a self-made man. He had uh, gradually clawed his way up in the world, and he had uh, become a world-famous figure. I suppose Franklin thought he was due a certain amount of respect for what he had accomplished. And Penn probably thought that if you weren't born rich, you didn't deserve respect. Franklin will never win his battle with Thomas Penn. This is not the new world, but the old. And Franklin is up against something much bigger than one arrogant aristocrat. In the summer, the lords and gentlemen of government leave the smoke and heat of London for their country estates, and Franklin, too, goes traveling. While visiting Lord Shelburne, he amazes everyone with a demonstration of his recent scientific discoveries. Wherever I go traveling, I always put a little oil in the hollow joint of my bamboo cane so I can perform this small experiment. When I come upon a pond, whose surface is made rough by the wind, I pour the small amount of oil onto it. The oil spreads with amazing speed, making part of the pond as smooth as a looking glass. The waves were all still, and he speculated for pages how to explain this phenomenon. From understanding how it stills the waves is not actually that elementary. Even today, as with most things involving hydrodynamics and all the rest, but uh, a good part of it is a change in surface tension. Surface tension is like a film, and the oil disrupts it, lowers it dramatically, so that when the wind comes over the water, it doesn't form waves nearly as well. Franklin travels around England and Scotland, meeting some of the great thinkers of the age. He visits James Watt and sees a demonstration of his steam engine, which is soon to transform the world. Franklin becomes friends with men like David Hume, the philosopher, Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, and William Strawn, the most important publisher in England. Franklin has talents and abilities in almost every branch of human science, and he's friends with the geniuses of the country, but he also knows how to chat with ordinary people at their level. As for myself, I've never met anyone who sees things more thoroughly as I do. If we ever disagree on anything, he quickly and with good humor pours in such light on the subject as to immediately convince me that I am wrong. These were not the great officials, the great office holders of the British Empire. They were people who were significant in another kind of non-governmental world, the world of science and philosophy and letters. Among them, he was at home, and they honored him 
for his genuine qualities. It is the densest happiness I've ever had in my life. The learning and wisdom and dazzling people I found there in such plenty will live on forever in my memory. Provinciae Pennsylvaniae Deputatus Franklin receives an honorary doctorate from St. Andrews University in Scotland and another from no less than Oxford University. Onatissimus Vier Benjaminus Franklin Armiger. Mr. Franklin, with two years of formal education, is now the famous Dr. Franklin, honored citizen of the Western world. Debbie, I wish I could tell you when I'm coming back. I hope if I have to stay here another winter, it will be more agreeable than the time I've spent up to now in England. I must bring this business with Penn to some conclusion. Your loving husband. My dear, I had a letter from Sister Meekham. Her youngest child is dead. Oh, maybe I told you that before. The marble fireplace you sent arrived safe. Mr. Hall desires to be remembered, and, well, I can't mention all the names, because everybody wants to be remembered to you. Your affectionate wife. Deborah the Devoted. He left home on and off for 15 years. Now, this is just unbelievable to us as 20th, 21st century people. You could leave your home, you could leave your wife, you could leave businesses scattered all over the East Coast for 15 years. How's it going to continue? Deborah is how it continued. A perfect example is in 1757. He says, Well, Deborah, I'm going to go to Great Britain. I'll be right back. I know we're getting ready to build a house. But don't worry, I'll be right back and don't build the house till I get back. He got on the boat and Deborah immediately began to build the house. During their long marriage, Franklin and his wife choose to gloss over their partner's inadequacies with words of affection. He calls her his dear child and she, in warm, compassionate, intensely human letters, also calls him... My dearest child, I had a visit from a man who had just seen you in London, and he tells me you now look well, which, for me, is the next best thing to seeing you. Mr. Mickle lies dead, and he was walking about fine the day before he dropped. Brother Potter is very poorly, three weeks under a violent fit of the gout in the limbs and stomach, and he says his heart. I went up to see him and told him to live healthy like me and my pappy. But he thinks he's so much smarter than me, he'd never follow my advice. Adieu, my dear. Take care of yourself for everyone's sake, but particularly for your affectionate wife. Deborah does not often complain of Franklin's absence. Too busy living, too awed by the miracle of remaining alive while death stalks all around her. If she ever takes time to meditate upon her fate, Deborah probably considers herself a lucky woman. It is 1762. Franklin and his son William have been in London for five years. Franklin is becoming worried that his son is losing himself in London high society. All my time has been taken up with the multiple diversions and entertainments of this bewitching city. Even now, I should be asleep. The watchman's voice is calling past five in the morning, and my candle is almost burned down. Such is my hurried life. William had mixed with Philadelphia's upper class, but in London he is experiencing a whole new order of wealth and opulence. Money, leisure, and property. I think it totally ruined the son. Uh, the father could put the brakes on and go back to, to business. For the son, it was a new way of life. He's tall and proper, very much the beau, but he's acquiring habits of laziness, not in the least interested in business. He seems to think he's going to live off my money. I've assured him that I fully intend to spend what little I have on myself. To be the son of Benjamin Franklin must have been terrifically exciting and terrifying at the same time. 
But the father, I think, really loved William because I think he saw him as his perfect experiment where he could invent someone he would have liked to have been himself if he hadn't been the son of a tradesman who made soap and candles. Now Franklin seizes an opportunity, an opportunity to advance his son, which is beyond anyone's imagining. The whole business was transacted so rapidly that not a tittle of it escaped until it was seen in the public papers. Then it was too late. There wasn't a single thing I could do to put a stop to this shameful affair. Franklin's scientific fame has given him access to friends in high places, including a close advisor to King George III. Working feverishly behind Penn's back, he pulls off one of the most amazing coups in American colonial history. We are pleased to appoint William Franklin Esquire to be governor of the province of New Jersey. It is our pleasure that you should prepare for him drafts of a commission and instructions. Royal governor, the king's representative in the colonies. Up to now, this top job had been given mainly to influential Britons. Franklin has achieved for his son the highest honor any colonist could hope for. In the hierarchical world of commoners and gentry, he has made his son an officer of the British Empire. It's a great success story. Run a, runaway boy with three biscuits under his arm, penniless and wet in Philadelphia, has a son who becomes a royal governor. It doesn't get much better than that. I have ordered from Chamberlain two prints for the governor's mansion. The picture by Wilson of my father and a portrait of our king. In 1763, Benjamin Franklin and his son can see nothing but a bright future for the British Empire. England's glory will be America's glory. For many years now, I've believed that the foundations, grandeur, and future stability of Britain lie in America. Like other foundations, they are low and unseen, but I believe they are strong enough to support the greatest political structure human wisdom has ever built, the British Empire. He, he's in his element. He couldn't be happier. Uh, he's living the good life as he understood it. And as I like to say, there was no reason it should ever end. At this point in history, all Americans, not just Franklin, are proud to be part of the most powerful empire on Earth. All that is soon to change. It is called the Stamp Tax. In 1765, Parliament passes a law decreeing that everything on paper, from playing cards to legal documents, is to be imprinted with a revenue stamp, a tax payable directly to the British government. The colonists are outraged. Franklin, separated from America by 3,000 miles and the months it takes for letters to cross the ocean, misjudges the mood of the colonies. Let's be frugal. Our own laziness taxes us more than kings and parliaments. Now Franklin was totally stunned when the news came pouring back across the Atlantic that all up and down the American coast, there was this furious outrage over paying this tax, and riots and stamp uh, commissions were being hanged in effigy. Franklin makes a huge political mistake by recommending a friend, John Hughes, for the post of Pennsylvania's stamp tax collector. They're now saying that you had planned the Stamp Act, and that you're the one getting it sent over here. In other colonies, mobs are ransacking and tearing down the houses of stamp tax officials. Franklin's friend, John Hughes, is hung in effigy and prepares for the worst. Next, the mob threatens Franklin's house. There, they meet Deborah. When the mobs were assembling, Deborah was told that she should leave the house. Instead, she sent her daughter, Sally, their daughter, to New Jersey, where Franklin's son was the governor, 
and she remained alone in the house and said she was going to defend her house. But I said I was sure you'd done nothing to hurt nobody, nor had I given offense to any person. So I wouldn't show the least uneasiness or move. And if anyone came to disturb me, I'd show them my resentment and be properly affronted. A-F-R-U-N-T-E-D, as she spells it, if anybody uh, thought otherwise. So cousin Davenport and brother came and we fetched a few guns and I set up the best sort of defense on the stairs as I could manage by myself. And I made one room into a magazine. I honor the courage you showed in that time of danger. The woman deserves a good house who is so determined to defend it. Is it the clergy spreading rumors that I had planned the Stamp Act? I should thank them that they don't also blame me for Adam's fall and the damnation of all mankind. Franklin had learned from science that if the facts no longer support your theory, you must be flexible enough to change your theory. The facts, he realizes, are these. Protests over the stamp tax are colony-wide and deeply felt. If he does not do something quickly, he will be destroyed politically. From a passive supporter of the tax, Franklin becomes its most outspoken critic. He begins a propaganda campaign in the British press, publishing this cartoon showing a helpless, chopped-up British Empire deprived of her American colonies. What was the feeling of America towards Great Britain before 1763? The best in the world. They not only respected you, but had a true affection for Great Britain. For its laws, customs, Franklin is the star witness when the issue of the stamp tax is brought before Parliament. He expresses American opposition to the tax in language that the leaders of this trading and manufacturing nation will really understand. And if we do not repeal this act? You will find they will stop buying your manufactured goods. The goods they take from Britain are either necessities or luxuries. The first, cloth and clothing, they can make at home. The second, they can do without. Parliament repeals the stamp tax. In America, Franklin's reputation soars. He will soon be appointed official agent for four colonies and is now unofficial spokesman for all of America. For most normal mortals, all this would be considered a full-time job. But Franklin somehow finds time for his true passion, inventing. I was charmed by the sweet sound coming from a drinking glass when you pass a wet finger around its rim. What if I could make an instrument with tuned glasses so these sounds could be made by a person sitting in front of it? I experimented with various forms the instrument would take and had glass blown to different sizes accordingly. I call it the glass harmonica. He probably saw somebody playing a system of glasses that were mounted in a frame, frantically rubbing their fingers around the rims, trying to play melodies, harmonies, and chords. Well, Franklin took that idea, and rather than rubbing your fingers around the rims, let's get the rims to go around your fingers. Mozart and Beethoven composed for Franklin's new instrument, and it is famous all through his lifetime. Franklin has always been fascinated with music. Like the modern advertising man, he knows that if you can put your message into a song, people will remember it. In the decade to come, the tune will remain God Save the King, but soon the two sides will be singing different words. Parliament has repealed the Stamp Act, but it does not admit defeat and continues to assert its right to tax the colonies. The power and authority to bind the colonies and people of America. Over the next decade, Parliament attempts to levy tariffs on glass, lead, paint, paper, and tea. 
And with each new tax, the colonists fight back with protests, boycotts, and organized violence. Franklin is an agent representing several colonies, and at the same time, an ardent supporter of the empire. He is finding that his role as mediator is becoming increasingly difficult. I was born in America and have lived a long time in England. There's nothing I want more than prosperity to both. I've written and talked so much on the subject that people are getting tired of hearing me. He's trying to straddle two sides that are emerging, and, and there really are two sides now. And the empire is a different thing for him, uh, and he's grappling with this problem of how to hold it together. In my most despairing moments, I think of that story of the sleeping man dreaming about how to save his house. In his dreams, he mumbles, time is, and then time was, and wakes up to find his house tumbling down around him and is heard to cry out, the time is past. I'm sorry to hear that your gout has returned and that it's not in my power to be near enough to you to rub you with my light hand. When will it be in your power to come home? How I long to see you. I hope you won't stay longer than this fall. I find myself growing very feeble, very fast. It is 1771. Franklin leaves London to spend two weeks at a friend's country estate. A portly 65-year-old, subject to episodes of painful gout, he too is beginning to feel his age. Looking out over this peaceful country scene, Franklin decides to write, for the first time, the story of his life. He's depressed, he's dispirited, I think this is a really crucial moment in his life, and it's in those six months that he writes the first part of the autobiography. He started it as a letter to his son. His son was putting on airs, was trying to become upper class. So Franklin starts off by saying, remember where we come from. I was a poor kid. I was a runaway. I had a few coins in my pocket when I came into Philadelphia for the first time. Franklin presents himself as a role model. No soul-searching here, no searing personal confession, but a do-it-yourself manual on how to succeed in the world in an acceptable way. This is a book of instruction for all those who have the patience and wit to take good advice that's generously offered. I was seven years old. It was a holiday, and my pockets were filled with coppers. I went directly to a shop, and being charmed with the sound of a whistle, I spent all my money on it. Delighted with my purchase, I whistled all over the house. Then my brothers and cousins began laughing at me for my folly, told me that I'd paid four times too much for it, and described all the other things I could have bought with the rest of my money. I began to cry. The thought of having wasted my money gave me more pain than the whistle gave me pleasure. True to his good Puritan upbringing, Franklin draws the moral lesson from the story. I grew up in the world and observed the actions of men. One, a miser, gave up a comfortable living and all the joys of benevolent friendship for the sake of accumulating wealth. Poor man, I said, you pay too much for your whistle. I see a sweet girl who married an ill-natured brute of a man because he was rich. What a pity, say I, that she should pay so much for a whistle. I think that humanity brings much misery on itself by the false value they put on things, by their giving away too much for the whistle. The Autobiography is the first great book of American literature, and in some ways the most important book, because of the way Franklin's own life incorporates the American dream, the rise from impotence to importance, from dependence to independence. He's writing for America. He really means this to be something which will teach Americans how to live. 
I think that he sees Americans struggling for the soul of the continent, endlessly tempted by the possibilities of wealth, endlessly tempted by the open land, by the fortunes that you could make. And I think what he wants to tell Americans is, sure, you feel those surging desires. Sure, you want the wealth which is there, apparently, for the taking. I think he's saying that that's not all there is in life and that you're going to perish if you make that all that there is in your life. You're going to tear each other apart. You're going to lose sight of the common life. Boston, Massachusetts. The city had been under British occupation. Royal troops had fired on a crowd and the people responded with cries of vengeance. Distrust of the crown is escalating and Franklin fears that it will tear the empire apart. He's trying to tell his American friends, just cool it, just remain dutiful uh, and we'll get through this tough time. But I don't think he fully appreciates just how enraged American opinion is becoming. Franklin thinks that he can save the situation with a political dirty trick. He has been shown some letters written by Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor of Massachusetts. The letters suggest that Hutchinson had called for the sending of British troops to Boston. Franklin decides to send copies of these incriminating letters to the Boston radicals. He hopes that Hutchinson will be blamed for all the troubles in New England. What Franklin tries to do by communicating those letters is say, don't rebel against the king. Act against the governor. It's his fault. Remain loyal to the empire and throw out a badly functioning portion of it, that person. It is Franklin's desperate attempt to save the empire. He was profoundly attached to England. He loved the British Empire, which he called a precious China vase. He didn't want it broken. He didn't want a separation. And he's, to the last minute, he was still trying to save it in some way. As Franklin intended, sending the letters has shifted the anger of the colonists from the Crown to Hutchinson. The people of Massachusetts are now demanding his removal. William Franklin, the royal governor of New Jersey, is horrified. Father, Governor Hutchinson is furious about the publications of his letters and his subsequent treatment by the people. He is gloomy and in low spirits. There's even talk of his leaving for England. Some here are saying it was you who sent the Hutchinson letters. Others say that it was Mr. Temple. I can only assume that it was Temple. Rumors had been going around for a long time that Benjamin Franklin was the one who sent these letters. William had denied that it was true, believing that it was not true. He could not believe that his father would do such a dishonorable thing. His father finally wrote to him and he said that he was the one who had sent the letters to Massachusetts. William was crushed. He confesses that it was him, at which point the British government goes ballistic. There is reason to apprehend that this rebellion in America has been much promoted, nay, encouraged by the treacherous correspondence, advice, and comfort given by wicked and desperate persons within this realm. In England, it is not to be Thomas Hutchinson who will be blamed for the troubles in America, but Franklin himself. His role as a conciliator, his dreams of a great Anglo-American empire, Everything he has worked for since he came to England 16 years earlier is about to come crashing down around his head. Time is, time was, time becomes the past on Saturday afternoon, January 29th, 1774, when Franklin is called before His Majesty's Privy Council. It must have been the darkest day in Franklin's life, the day he was called to what is known as the cockpit in Whitehall. The cockpit where they used to go for cockfights and where that day a Christian was going to be fed to the lions. 
the lion being the Solicitor General, Alexander Wedderburn. The doctor tells us that Mr. Hutchinson's letters had the effect of turning the mother country against her colonies. In truth, we have standing before us the real incendiary, the man behind those committees who are inflaming the whole province against His Majesty's government. They have well learned the lessons taught in Dr. Franklin's school of politics. People were laughing all the time, those lords, and he remained there like a statue, not a muscle in his face moving. It lasted a good hour, and for that good hour, he just stood there motionless. Dr. Franklin stands as the planner, the inventor, the prime conductor of this whole contrivance against His Majesty's governor, this thief, this wily American. A lot of politics is personal. He took it personally. And it was meant to be taken as such. This was the turning point in Franklin's life. The man who had been so loyal to the empire came to England and stayed there and talked about ending his life in England to be humiliated like this in front of this array of aristocrats. That made Benjamin Franklin a revolutionary. Dear Debbie, you'll have heard by now that they have taken away my position as postmaster. The accusation is that I am too much attached to the interests of America. They intended to disgrace me. In fact, they have done me an honor. I expect to be at sea by the time you get this letter. You will find your pappy has become an old man. And it seems only yesterday that you and I were considered to be one of the boys and girls. Oh, swiftly does time fly. Christmas, 1774. Honored Father. Noon Monday, Mr. Bache sent his clerk with the news. My poor mother had died. She had had a stroke some time ago. And when I last saw her, she knew she didn't have much longer to live. I truly wish you had come back this fall. I think her sadness in not seeing you for so long preyed on her spirits. In March of 1775, Franklin sails home to America. The death of his wife is only one of the many catastrophes engulfing him. What he once saw as that precious China vase, the Anglo-American Empire, is in the process of breaking apart. Almost as a relief, he revisits a scientific problem that has puzzled him for years. The fact that it takes several weeks longer to sail west to America than east to England. Taking a series of careful water temperature measurements as the ship crosses the Atlantic, he confirms the existence of a warm river of water within the ocean itself, the Gulf Stream. His accurate charting of the Gulf Stream becomes crucial to navigation and is basic to our understanding of weather patterns to this very day. April 19, 1775, the battles at Lexington and Concord. Franklin arrives in Philadelphia two weeks later to find the colonies in turmoil. He sees that most Americans are not eager for revolution. They are desperate to resolve their differences with the mother country. It is a beautiful spring day as William Franklin, the royal governor of New Jersey, rides through Philadelphia to meet his father. Father and son have not seen each other for 12 years. As the elder Franklin has become more radical, so the son has become more conservative. 
he identified more and more with law and order as royal governor and saw the revolutionaries as crazies and dangerous. They would pull the whole structure down. Benjamin, on the other hand, thought the treatment that he personally had received in England was emblematic of the way America had been treated. I think the father feels that he can straighten his son out and the son will be on the same side. He'll be with him. Their meeting takes place at the country estate of an old friend and former political ally, Joseph Galloway. Up to this moment, the elder Franklin had been very circumspect about expressing his real views to anyone. We passed the bottle around freely and the doctor finally opened himself up to us. He declared himself in favor of any measure which would attain complete independence. He saw the government in power in England as thoroughly corrupt. And, and he felt that the resources of the colonies were immense. He was convinced America would prevail. So we see them sitting around and passing the cup back and forth and drinking uh, by the fire as the father recites his version of history. And we see William's anger developing, his resentment. There are in truth only two possible paths, one which will lead to peace, the other to anarchy, misery, the horrors of a civil war. England has become a place of injustice bribes and foolish quarrels. Our connection to that rotten old state corrupts and poisons us. Nothing will ever influence me to neglect the duty which I owe to my country. Nor will the most furious rage of the most intemperate zealots lead me to swerve from the duty which I owe to his majesty. You say that your duty is to your king and I shouldn't blame you for differing with me in public affairs. But there are natural duties of a son to a father which come before politics. William will not be moved. He is an officer of the British Empire, and to the Empire he will remain loyal. If it's your intention to set the colonies on fire, I hope you'll take care to run away and not get burned when the blaze is out of control. You are a thorough courtier and see everything through the eyes of the British government. He's loved William, and William is as close to him as anybody on the planet is. And there's William betraying him at the moment of his most desperate need, at the moment that he's shakiest probably in his entire life, not at all certain of what he's about to undertake, not certain whether the Americans will even go for the revolution that he's now keen on. When his own son refused to join him in this revolution in which Franklin was risking his life and his reputation and his property. This seemed to Franklin an absolutely unbelievable, unspeakable betrayal. The elder Franklin will later describe his son's refusal to support him as giving him more grief than anything in the world. He thought his son had betrayed him by taking the wrong side. For Franklin, there were no two ways about America's leaving England. There was not going to be any British empire in which Americans were subject to Englishmen. That was not going to happen. Franklin, 70 years old, now joins with the most radical leaders in America. He is promoting not just separation from England, but a revolutionary new idea that ordinary people can have control over their government, that America does not need a king. On June 25, 1776, Benjamin Franklin is in Philadelphia working with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on a draft of the Declaration of Independence. I think that it is the natural right of men to quit when they please the society or state or the country in which they were born and either join with another 
or form a new one, as they may think proper. On that same June day, in New Jersey, William Franklin is arrested by a government he adamantly refuses to recognize. He writes to his own son. Dear son, I must go. I'm sick, but it was with great difficulty that I persuaded their low mightinesses to postpone my departure. Congress sent two doctors to make sure my illness was not feigned. Hypocrites always suspect hypocrisy in others. I must leave tomorrow, either dead or alive. God bless you. Be dutiful to your grandfather, to whom you owe many obligations. William Franklin is thrown into prison and will end up an exile in England. The father had once made William an officer of the British Empire, and now it is the father who refuses to help his son in any way. Benjamin Franklin takes his anger with him to the grave, beyond the grave, for in his will, his once favorite son will get nothing. You fought against me in the last war. I leave you nothing more of my estate than what you tried to deprive me of. I don't think there's any question that Benjamin Franklin was a great statesman. Um, and I have no question that he was a brilliant inventor. I think he was a wonderful journalist and writer. But I think he was very hard on family and friends. And no different than an awful lot of leaders who are put in the public eye and we expect them to be saints in private uh, as well as giants in public. Franklin destroys everything around him to create something new. He destroys the old British order. He destroys aristocracy. In the process of creating something new, he destroyed what was closest to him, his relationship with the person closer than anyone to him, his son. The publisher, William Strawn, is a good friend of both men. He writes to Benjamin Franklin on the eve of the revolution. Six years ago, you predicted to me much of what has happened, but much of what you yourself did help fulfill this prophecy. And now you've carried things too far. There will be no end to the public calamities. I see many worthy, loyal men driven from their homes in America. I see pictures of misery and anarchy when the business is done. You could have continued in the exercise of study and in the company of fellow philosophers. Instead, in the evening of your life, you choose to embark upon this, the most arduous, dangerous, and uncertain cause that ever man has engaged in. October 1776. Benjamin Franklin prepares for his voyage to France. His only living sister is convinced that she will never see him again. I cannot bear the thought of you going abroad again. You positively must not go. You've served the public beyond any other man. Into your old age. Let some younger person now take on this painful work. Do as much good here as Congress thinks proper. Your talents are certainly superior to other men. But brother, don't go. Pray, don't go. With great secrecy, Franklin leaves Philadelphia on a ship aptly named the Reprisal. His mission is of the utmost urgency. The Americans don't have a hope of winning the revolution unless they can secure an alliance with England's most powerful rival, France. 
I think that the whole endeavor was stark staring mad. Franklin has to do this impossible thing, or this almost impossible thing, to persuade the French to join this war. As much as the fate of the revolution is in George Washington's hands with the army on land, it's with Franklin as he crosses the sea. I will do anything my fellow citizens think proper. As the shopkeeper says about his short ends of cloth, use me for anything you want. I'm old and good for nothing but rags. In 1776, Benjamin Franklin is 70 years old. His wife and most of his contemporaries are dead. But far from retiring, he is about to face one of the most difficult challenges of his long life. Before setting off for France, he had been in the forefront of the revolutionary cause. In June, he had assisted in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. Now in October, the war is in full cry, and so far has been disastrous for the new nation. George Washington's army has suffered decisive defeats at Long Island, White Plains, Fort Washington, and Fort Lee. Britain has the most well-disciplined, well-supplied, well-stocked army and navy in the world. America has virtually nothing. America was just this sort of young, new, marginal place. We couldn't beat the most powerful nation on the planet without someone's help. It just wasn't going to happen. If the Americans got French help, preeminently an Ameri a French alliance, French weapons, then the revolution had a chance of succeeding. If the Americans did not get French help, the American Revolution almost certainly would fail. We were incredibly fortunate that Franklin was willing to do it. There's no diplomatic core in existence. There's barely a government. So that it has, it has to be an informal, personal mission. And Franklin, because he had the personal recognition over there, was the one diplomat who could do it. When Franklin arrives in Paris in December 1776, it is a far cry from the city of light, the wide open boulevards and stunning architecture of later years. The average Parisian lives in abject poverty, in narrow crooked streets with open sewers running down the middle. Starving beggars and homeless families are everywhere. In the elegant mansions near the Tuileries Gardens, where the poor are forbidden to go, the upper classes prepare for their soirees. No elegant face is complete without the application of at least one mouche, originally used to disguise smallpox scars. Elaborate wigs are placed over bald heads, shaven to discourage lice. At Versailles, King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, preside over a world of idle luxury. This is the society to which the former printer from Philadelphia will have to gain access. He already has one powerful weapon, his reputation. The general public in Paris already then idolized Franklin. People had read Poor Richard, they had they knew about the way to wealth, they knew about his writings, they were very proud that the theory of electricity and lightning had been proved in France for the first time. He was 
the embodiment of all they thought America to be. There was a vogue for things American in France at this time. Many French intellectuals looked to America as a new world, as a fresh world, as a world where human nature was closer to its natural origins than the human nature that one found in the confines of Europe. And so Franklin arrived from America, and presumably he shared some of this noble savage character. Franklin is kind of the natural genius whose development has not been fettered by a European court. He's flourished. His intellect has, has sprung beautiful shoots in the American wilderness. And the French are absolutely entranced by this kind of native genius. The most surprising thing is the contrast between the luxury of our capital, the, the elegance of our fashions, the, the magnificence of Versailles, the polite haughtiness of our nobility, and Benjamin Franklin. Everything about him announces the simplicity and innocence of the natural man. His clothing is rustic. His bearing is simple but dignified. His language is direct and his hair unpowdered. Such a person uh, is made to excite curiosity in Paris. Uh, people cluster around him as he walks down the street and ask, who is this old peasant who has such a noble air? Franklin wants to oblige their expectations. He decides to present himself as an authentic American rustic. They want it, they'll get it. He is the American from central casting. When Franklin first arrives in France, he is wearing a fur hat, simply to keep his head warm. The frontiersman's hat causes a sensation. For the French, it is proof that its wearer is a true, natural man. Franklin, who has never lived out of a city, now sends back to Pennsylvania for great supplies of these coonskin caps that he's never worn in his life. All the attention surprises even the master publicist himself. He writes with amusement to his daughter. My picture is everywhere, on the lids of snuff boxes, on rings, busts. The numbers sold are incredible. My portrait's a bestseller. You have prints and copies of prints and copies of copies spread everywhere. Your father's face is now as well known as the man in the moon. Franklin's mission is top secret. He is ostensibly visiting France as a private citizen. From the moment of his arrival, all Paris has been abuzz with rumors. Nobody really knows what he is up to. Lord Stormont, British ambassador to the French court, reports back to London. Some people think that the famous Dr. Franklin has come to France on personal business. I am convinced he is here on some secret mission from Congress. He is a devious man, incapable of truth, and will, I am sure, try to draw the French into openly supporting the cause of the rebels. He is very well regarded by general opinion and has excellent connections at court. In a word, my lord, I look upon him as a dangerous enemy, and I only regret that some English warship did not meet up with him on his way here. The British ambassador has good reason to worry. Franklin soon attempts to make official contact with the French court. To the French foreign minister, Le Comte de Vergennes. Sir, we request an audience with your excellency in order to present our credentials. We beg to acquaint your excellency that we are fully empowered by the Congress of the United States to negotiate a treaty of friendship and commerce between our two countries. Charles Gravier, Le Comte de Vergennes, Minister of Foreign Affairs to the court of Louis XVI, is the key man Franklin will have to deal with in his efforts to get support from the French. Mr. Franklin's conversation is civil and sweet. He seems to be a man of much wit, talent and intelligence, but careful, very careful. This does not surprise me. Bougen, like Franklin, is quiet, hard-working, avuncular, 
a relatively elderly man, uh, one of the few members of the French aristocracy that had married for love and almost lost his diplomatic career as a result of it. A man picked by the king because the king didn't expect so quiet and cautious and prudent a man would make waves, whereas in fact, like Franklin, Vergen was a zealot. Vergen is an ardent nationalist, eager for France to resume her rightful place as Europe's greatest power. In the 18th century, there are two great world powers, and they are France and England. They had been at war with each other as rivals, and the English had defeated the French in the French and Indian War. And they were fighting over world domination, in essence. France is uh, arguably the world's greatest military power, but had lost the last war uh, in a big way to the British. And of course, French policy is one of whenever the opportunity arises, recouping that loss. But whether they were ready to go to war is, is, was the crucial question. The government was not in the best financial shape in the world. In fact, uh, uh, Turgot, the great minister of finance, had warned Louis XVI, the king, that the first gunshot will bankrupt the state. Vergen knows that France is not yet ready for a full-scale war, and that King Louis will have to be convinced that the Americans are worthy of French help. Proceeding with caution, he agrees to meet with Franklin and his co-commissioners, but only in secret. Vergen makes it clear that France will be prepared to fully back the young nation only if there is a real chance of winning. Naturally, the French are uh, reluctant as eager as they were to seek revenge, they're reluctant to get themselves caught if the Americans should suddenly settle with the British and the, the French find themselves in a, in a world war with, with Britain without the support of the Americans. So there's a good deal of suspicion uh, of, on the part of the French whether the Americans have the stuff to make this revolution stick. Vergen tells Franklin that France will provide aid under the table. But there will be no alliance for the Americans, at least not yet. Franklin knows that his stay in France is going to be a long one. A wealthy friend, Le Ray de Chaumont, offers the use of his country estate at Passy. It is strategically situated one half mile outside of Paris and just a short carriage ride from the court at Versailles. And uh, he proceeded to hold a kind of salon there. He entertained important people and generally operated as a, a, a representative of, of, a, of a foreign country. He was like an ambassador without a formal portfolio, even though he spoke, incidentally, terrible French. In social terms, he found friends among the Parisian intellectuals and the Parisian intelligentsia. He ingratiated himself with all those folks who were willing to have him over to their homes for dinner, to invite him to their salons. Americans, like the British, generally hate the French. The French are their traditional enemies, despised Roman Catholics, fops, and frog eaters. But Franklin, unlike most of his provincial countrymen, is a true man of the world and finds French society utterly congenial. This is the most civilized nation on earth. The first people you meet here try to find out what you like so they can tell others. If you tell someone that you like mutton, then at every meal they serve you mutton. Someone, it seems, gave out the information that I love the ladies. So now everyone presents me with their ladies, or ladies present themselves to be embrassés. That is, to have their necks kissed. Kissing a young lady's lips is considered rude, and kissing her cheeks might rub off the paint. He begins to just lay groundwork everywhere. He's willing to go to any salon. He's willing to talk with anybody. He's willing to do whatever is available to him to be done. You must remember that there was no foreign service. There was no tradition. This was one of his chief inventions, so to say. He had to create this system as he went. His 
basic idea was very simple. He thought the only way I can obtain help for America is in having these French see eventually that it is in their interest to help us, and that will take some time. I think what you have during his embassy in Paris, there at Passy, is the fulfillment of everything that he'd ever acquired in his life before that. All of the skills in dealing with people, all the skills in psyching out where people are coming from, what they want, what they need, what they live by, how to play the game so as to curry favor with them, how to ingratiate yourself with them, all of that, all the manipulativeness, all of the cunning, all of the way of getting around people, all of the adaptability, all of the waiting for the right moment. I think in every way that embassy to France was the culmination, was the pinnacle of his entire life. For over a year, Franklin and Vergen do a curious diplomatic dance. Franklin wants an official alliance with France, but is careful not to pressure Vergen for what he cannot give. And the minister continues to send small amounts of money and arms to America. It all has to take place very unofficially, with a wink and a nod. The British are aware that something is going on between Franklin and Vergen. They have a network of spies who send weekly reports back to London by leaving drops of supposed love letters in a hollow tree in the Tuileries Gardens. In the blank spaces of the letters, written in invisible ink, are the real messages. John Le Carre would have loved Paris in the 1780s. It's full of spies and moles and counter spies. Franklin's own secretary, Edward Bancroft, was a spy in the pay of the British government, but was also spying for the Americans at times. <laughs> He's the secretary of the legation. It's crazy. Some of the reports sent back by England's breathless spies border on science fiction. We have discovered that the doctor, with the assistance of French technicians, is in the process of building a great number of reflecting mirrors, which will concentrate so much heat from the sun as to be able to destroy anything by fire at a considerable distance. The apparatus is to be set up at Calais on the French coast, whereby they mean to burn and destroy the British Navy sitting in our harbors. And more. The doctor proposes a conducting chain linking Calais to Dover. He will connect it to a prodigious electrical machine of his invention and convey a powerful shock to explode our entire island. Franklin is well aware that both the British and French have spies everywhere, but he remains philosophical. It's impossible to uncover the falsity of pretended friends. If I was sure that my valet was a spy, as he probably is, I wouldn't dream of discharging him for that fact, if, of course, he was a good valet. With the help of Lorraine de Chaumont's liveried servants, Franklin entertains great numbers of visitors, including a young American, Elkanah Watson. I was invited to dine with Dr. Franklin at Passy, I was very embarrassed, not knowing any French and being dressed in the American style. We entered a large room where I saw several extremely well-dressed people bowing to us. As an unsophisticated American, I bowed back to each one of them until Dr. Franklin kindly informed me that they were the servants. Now, all the guests greeted the wise old man in the most affectionate manner, some kissing him on both cheeks, for men kiss in France. One young lady called him Papa. I had been expecting great ceremony, but everyone was free and cheerful. Franklin, never the Puritan moralist, greatly enjoys flirting, and this enjoyment is thoroughly reciprocated. One favorite is a neighbor, the elegant, beautiful, intelligent, and married 33-year-old Madame Brion de Jouy. 
Franklin calls her La Brillante, the brilliant. For four years, Franklin spends almost every Wednesday and Saturday evening at her house. She offers him tea, concerts, elegant dinners, and games of chess. In between visits, they write letters to one another. Madame La Brillante. They say there are only 10 commandments, but I think there are really 12. The 11th is that we should increase and multiply, and the 12th, I suggest, is that we should love one another. Tell me, my dear, if my religiously keeping these extra two commandments compensates for my breaking one of the 10, the one which forbids me from coveting my neighbor's wife, which I confess I break constantly. I understand it's the belief of certain fathers of the church that one of the most effective ways of getting rid of a temptation is to satisfy it. Pray instruct me, my lovely confessor, how far I may venture to practice this theory. Though Franklin is twice his neighbor's age, Madame Brion is only too happy to play this game. On the subject of lust, all great men are tainted with it and call it a weakness, but it's not. You're kind and lovable and you are loved in return. What's wrong with that? Go on doing great things and loving pretty women, provided, of course, you obey my three commandments. Always love God, America, and above all, moi. Franklin understood what a reputation he had as a ladies' man. And in fact, his reputation exceeded the reality, as Franklin himself knew. But Franklin understood that a reputation as a ladies' man, especially if you were in your 70s, was something that the French just loved. You couldn't be a politician in France unless you had relationships with influential women. They call them the salonniers. And, and these women ran these salons where everybody who was anybody came. And at, at one point, there was a, a, a salon where 300 women gathered around Franklin, and they placed a crown on his head. And don't think these women didn't go home and tell their husbands, uh, I think the France should become the ally of America. And they had influence. So he was always being the diplomat, even while he was charming the ladies of France. In the evening, one of Franklin's favorite pastimes is chess. One night he plays a long game by the bathtub where Madame Brion is soaking. The next day he apologizes to his neighbor that he was so deeply absorbed that he fears he has let her get waterlogged. For Franklin, chess is more than a game. In life and in chess, we have points to gain, adversaries to deal with, and a large variety of good or bad things which we bring on ourselves by our own prudence or lack of it. In playing chess, for example, we learn to plan for the future. The player is always thinking, if I move this piece, what will be the advantage of my new situation? What use can my adversary make of it? You learn to survey the whole chessboard, the relations of the several pieces, the dangers they're exposed to, and the several possibilities of their aiding each other. You learn caution, not to make your move too quickly, lest you put yourself in a bad position, and must live with your rashness. Lastly, you learn from chess the habit of not getting discouraged, even when, for the moment, you find yourself in a state of seemingly insurmountable difficulty. After six months in France, Franklin has made no progress in bringing the French into the war. From America, he is receiving frantic appeals for the most basic of supplies, but no money to pay for them. Franklin often became exceedingly frustrated at what he was asked to do, continually to provide monetary resources, weapons, boots, ammunition, all of this stuff, for the American army, essentially to keep the Continental Army in the field. And he had almost nothing to work with. In many cases, he was simply dealing with private French contractors. 
and he was asking them to ship goods to the American colonies on credit, on the credit of the Continental Congress, credit which was rapidly disintegrating. The amount of work that Franklin had to do was significant. We think of him having a good time in France, and he did to some extent, but he also worked very hard and he was getting tired. Franklin's fellow Americans are not making his job any easier. He is one of three co-commissioners appointed by Congress to negotiate with the French. One of the commissioners, Silas Dean, has been accused of embezzling funds. The other, Arthur Lee, is suspicious of Franklin to the point of paranoia. Lee has been spreading ugly gossip about Franklin to his allies in Congress. Franklin's very powerful enemies used every indiscretion that he ever committed to portray him as a, as a, a, a man who just was a skirt chaser and uh, that sort of thing. And there was rumors, rather vicious ones, that he made a lot of money under the table, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, Lee has been bombarding Franklin with criticisms of the way he has been running the delegation. After months of Lee's constant sniping, Franklin can bear it no longer. It's true I've not answered your letters. I have received and borne your magisterial snubbings and rebukes in silence. I'm old and don't have long to live. I have much to do and no time for these sort of quarrels. I'm worried about the success of our mission, which is hurt by your sick mind that is forever torturing itself with jealousies and suspicions and fantasies that everyone means you wrong or fails to respect you. If you don't cure yourself of these ravings, you'll end up insane. God preserve you from so terrible an evil, and for his sake and mine, pray suffer me to live in peace. But Franklin, as usual, prefers to keep his frustrations private. The letter to Lee will remain unsent. He says at some point in uh, one of Poor Richard's almanacs, let all men know thee, but no man know thee thoroughly. Men ford easily where they see the shallows. So you have to keep a part of yourself, maybe a large part of yourself, hidden from the world. In the dreary French autumn of 1777, Franklin is getting nothing but bad news from America. Washington has suffered a string of military defeats. Fort Ticonderoga has been captured. The British General Burgoyne is on his way to controlling the entire Hudson Valley. New York, too, is under British control. The worst news they heard was that General Howe had captured Philadelphia, and that was Franklin's hometown, his children, all his papers were now in British hands. It was really crushing, and yet he kept up a bold front, and when someone said to him, uh, I hear that uh, General Howe has captured Philadelphia, Franklin said, no, no, you have it wrong. Philadelphia has captured Howe which was nice, nice bravado, but it still, it still wasn't uh, very good news. Franklin knows that without French military intervention, the United States will continue to lose battles. And the more they lose, the less likely it is that Vergennes will agree to intervene. It is an impossible situation. The French will not begin a quarrel with England as long as they can avoid it, nor will they give us any open assistance of ships or troops. Indeed, we're scarcely allowed to admit that the French are giving us any aid at all. Well, this leaves America the glory of working out her deliverance by her own effort and bravery. From now on, we'd be well advised to depend chiefly on God's blessing and not that of King Louis. Just as Franklin is almost ready to give up, an American messenger is on his way from the port of Nantes with the latest news from America. 
I didn't have time to get off my horse when Franklin shouted to me, Did Howe really take Philadelphia? Yes, sir, I said. And the poor gentleman sadly shook his head and was heading back to the house. I stopped him. But, sir, I have greater news than that. General Burgoyne and his whole army are prisoners of war. In a military operation which astounds the Europeans, an army of American farmers has defeated a large invasion force at Saratoga. Crack British and Hessian troops who have rarely lost a battle anywhere in the world. Franklin makes sure every influential person in Paris gets the news, starting with Vergen. The circumstances are now more favorable for the establishment of an understanding between France and the United Colonies of North America. The prospect of an alliance between France and America terrifies the British. King George will do anything to avoid this. The many instances of Franklin's malevolent behavior convince me that hatred of this country is the constant object of his mind. Yet it is so desirable to end the war with America in order to avenge the insolent conduct of the French that I think it proper to keep open the channel of intercourse with that insidious man. The British decide to send out peace feelers and dispatch an agent to meet with Franklin. For several weeks, Vergen has been stalling and Franklin fears the alliance with France will come too late to save the revolution. He makes a brilliant move. He sees an opportunity to use the British willingness to negotiate to force events with Vergen. Franklin, while he was in Paris, was engaged in a complicated maneuver to make the French think that the American states might cozy back up to the British to make the British think that the Americans were getting what they wanted from the French, all the while playing from a position of weakness. For Franklin, the chess master, the game is always being played. And there are always 16 or 32 moves to be thinking of in advance. Sometimes he would get stuck in a position where he was obviously in a losing position. And he would arrange to distract his opponent. He wasn't above moving the pieces. Franklin agrees to meet with the British agent. He makes sure that Vergen will find out about the meeting and suspect that Franklin is secretly entertaining a British peace proposal. In fact, Franklin has no intention of making peace with England. We know what really took place at the meeting because the agent, an American loyalist, reports every word spoken back to the British. He uses a code in which numbers are substituted for key words. I called on 7-2. He received me very kindly at first. I told him that I wished to be honored with a temper of 4-5 on the terms of a possible reconciliation. He told me how unsatisfactory previous informal attempts had been. He considered them time lost. And now it was a matter of lives lost. And as he spoke, he worked himself up into a fury of resentment against our country and king. I suggested to him that any private resentment he had about something that had happened to him personally while he was in Britain should be controlled for the good of his country. I flattered him and told him that he was too great a person to let private quarrels be mixed with the public good. The effect was to rouse the old man, who, as we know, is constitutionally calm and unemotional, to the passion of a high-mettled youth. I've never seen him so eccentric and so diffuse as he was today. He told me that other countries were wiser than 6-4 and ready to deal with 4-5, and that the savages of North America were more reasonable than the savages of Great Britain. And, and then he went off on the barbarity of Englishmen. At this point, he was almost breaking into a sweat. I said to him that I was here for instructions, not for insults. I said that the people of 6-4 were prepared for a 10-year 207. His answer was that America would endure a 50-year 207. 
before she would ever, ever give up 107. Vergen has no idea what really went on at the meeting, but Franklin's tactic spurs him into action. We put the question directly to Mr. Franklin. What must France do to block the commissioners from listening to any new proposals of peace from England? He answered that America had long been asking for a treaty of friendship and commerce between our two countries. The immediate conclusion of such a treaty would remove all uncertainties. On February 6, 1778, a treaty of alliance between France and the United States is signed in Paris. It is not just a matter of open French aid. Formal recognition by one of the world's two superpowers gives legitimacy to the shaky idea of independence. Franklin has accomplished the first goal of his mission. For the signing of the treaty, he wears a strangely unfashionable coat of Manchester velvet. It is the very same coat that he had worn during his humiliation before the British Privy Council four years earlier. Revenge is sweet, and for Franklin, very personal. He writes to his old friend, Katie Ray. Your troubles will not last much longer. We have formed an alliance with the French. This will serve to keep the English bull quiet and make him behave himself. His horns have been shortened. On March 20th, 1778, King Louis XVI, among the most powerful men in the world, formally receives the American commissioners at Versailles. Playing his role perfectly, Franklin flouts all court protocol. The natural man wears no sword and no wig. The king spoke with great sincerity. A sure congress, he said, of my friendship. I hope this treaty will benefit both our nations. Then Mr. Franklin spoke. Your majesty, he said, can count on Congress. And so, France is the first to recognize the independence of the United States. The fact that France signs a treaty and in effect therefore acknowledges the independence of British colonies is a remarkable milestone in history. This is a king who has agreed to support a revolution against another legitimate king. Really very unusual and in some ways, you know, if you want to give credit, bold and farsighted on the part of the French, but really I think they were tricked into it by Franklin. The treaty is also, and most importantly, a military alliance. France declares war on England. France's ally Spain eventually joins the war as well. But the Europeans have their own priorities, which are not necessarily those of the United States. The French aren't as interested in creating the new American Republic as they are in humiliating the British. And so they spend, initially spend a lot of their time down in the West Indies, sacking the West Indies, making money from, from destroying uh, English Caribbean colonies. Their goal is not to create the United States of America. Their goal is to break up the British Empire. Franklin's task now is to keep the pressure up, to convince the French to send troops and ships to America. The rebels might win a few battles, but as the war drags on, his countrymen are dying. Dear brother, the British have evacuated Philadelphia, and it seems that they have done little damage. I hope they never return. My son Benjamin disappeared soon after the Battle of Trenton and has not been heard of since. And God has taken poor Peter. Of the 17 children our father had, you and I, my dear brother, are now the only ones left. May I live to see the happiness of your children's children and peace for America.
During Franklin's long stay in France, he keeps up his lifelong interest in science. It is in France that he witnesses one of the world's first lighter-than-air balloons rising over the Champ de Mars. He develops a plan for daylight savings time. He studies the phenomenon of hailstorms in the summertime and speculates about the temperature of the upper atmosphere. He has the ingenious idea of combining two sets of lenses, thus inventing bifocals. I wear my spectacles constantly. With these, I only have to move my eyes up or down to see distinctly near and far. As one of the world's foremost scientists, Franklin serves on a commission to evaluate the theories of Anton Mesmer. Mesmer claims to have discovered a new magnetic life force which can send people into a hypnotic trance. Franklin debunks the idea that mesmerism has anything to do with magnetism. Franklin is now the honored guest at all sorts of public functions. A prominent mason, he initiates the philosopher Voltaire as a member of the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. He is a man of means and is able to indulge in all the luxuries that Paris has to offer. He did not live a parsimonious, frugal life over in France. He had a remarkably well-stocked wine cellar. The arm of man, said Franklin, is exactly the right length to lift a wine goblet up to his mouth and drink. That is the purpose of the arm, is to drink wine. Franklin believes that the prodigious intake of wine and rich food is the cause of his gout, an agonizing joint disease. One bout sends him to bed with a fever and extreme pain for over two weeks. When he can finally hobble out of bed, he sends this little playlet to Madame Brion. Oh. Ah. What have I done, Madame Gout, to deserve these cruel sufferings? Many things, sir. You eat and drink too freely, and you don't exercise. I do. Ah, 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 oh. As much exercise as I can, Madame Gout. But my work forces me to be sedentary. Forces you? Let's look at your day. You wake up in the morning, eat a huge breakfast, tea with cream, one or two buttered toasts, and then a few slices of dried beef. Is this good for the digestion? And then what do you do? You sit down at your desk and you don't move until dinner. And after dinner, do you walk in the garden with your beautiful lady friend? Oh, no. You play chess. I take rides in my carriage. You call that exercise, the swaying of a carriage suspended on springs? You should thank me, Mr. Franklin. I'm the one who keeps you healthy by administering my wholesome corrections. So take that twinge and that. In the spring of 1778, a new commissioner is making his way to Paris. He has been sent by Congress to replace Silas Dean. John Adams, Puritan from Braintree, Massachusetts, is not as taken with France as Franklin is. He sees it as a test of his immortal soul. There is everything here that can improve learning, refine taste, and purify the heart. But I must remember that there is also everything here which can seduce, betray, deceive, deprave, corrupt, and debauch. John Adams was a major voice in Congress. He had been perhaps the most eloquent supporter of independence before July 1776. He certainly had won the respect of the other delegates uh, by his eloquence and by his strong commitment to the American cause. He was straightforward, he said what he thought, but those strengths did not necessarily make him a good diplomat. He can't dance, drink, game, flatter, promise, dress, swear with gentlemen, make small talk, or flirt with the ladies. In short, 
He has none of the essential qualities to make him a courtier. Nobody could be less suited to be a diplomat in any court in Europe than John Adams. He has no social skills. More to the point, he never wanted to acquire any. Uh, Adams comes into the Paris scene as sort of the bull in the china shop. You can just picture Franklin going, oh my God, everything I've done here, all the groundwork I've laid, this idiot can destroy in five minutes. Adams, who had left America two months earlier, is surprised to find on his arrival that the alliance with France had been concluded before he even left home. At Franklin's invitation, he takes up residence at Passy. But his mood is not improved by his intense and growing jealousy of Franklin's fame in France. It doesn't help that at parties he is introduced as the collègue de Monsieur Franklin. When he tells them his name, he is then asked if he is the famous Adams, meaning Samuel Adams. I had to tell them that I was not le fameux Adams. So then it was settled. I'm the American that nobody's heard of, a man of no consequence, a zero, particularly when compared with le fameux Franklin. John Adams freaks out when he sees how Franklin is getting ahead in French society and presumably conducting American mission in France. Adams found Franklin's willingness to curry the favor of the French government ultimately inappropriate and intolerable. And while Franklin fully recognized that the United States had almost no leverage with France, that the United States could get what it needed only by tending closely to French interests. To Adams, that was anathema. Adams wanted to stand up for American interests against France if necessary, just as America had been standing up for American interests against Britain. Mr. Adams persists in thinking that France is the greatest enemy of America. He thinks that gratitude towards France is the greatest of follies, that it will ruin us. He makes no secret of his opinions, indeed expresses them publicly, sometimes in the presence of English ministers. This court must be treated with delicacy, and it is my intention, while I am here, to procure what advantages I can for our country by trying to please this court. An expression of gratitude is not only our duty, but also very much in our interest. Anything which our countryman does to displease France, I'll try to prevent. John Adams could have been in France for the next millennium and never gotten a, a sou out of the, uh, the French. And, uh, and only Franklin's approach has a prayer of working with, uh, with the French. But, uh, but Adams is just livid that Franklin is getting someplace for nothing, and Adams, who's working so hard, is getting no place. The life of Dr. Franklin here in France is one long party. He eats breakfast late in the morning, and as soon as his breakfast is over, crowds of people come to his court, philosophers, academics, his literary friends, even women and children, thrilled at the great honor of viewing his bald head listening to him telling stories about his simplicity. Well, by then, it's the afternoon. Time to dress for dinner. Dr. Franklin never turns down a dinner invitation. He seldom comes home before nine, and sometimes as late as midnight. I'd be happy to do all the work myself. All I want is a few moments a day for him to sign letters or give advice on what's to be done. He has time for everyone else but me. By 1780, Franklin has been in France for almost four years. He has yet to persuade the French to send troops to American soil. The situation is becoming critical. Since Saratoga, there have been few victories, and now the British have invaded the South. Death and disease have spread from the army 
to the civilian population. The American economy has collapsed, and now, with no money for supplies or pay, Washington's army is facing widespread desertion. A desperate Congress is urging Franklin to prod the French for more help. And with no collateral to offer, the United States is dependent more than ever on French goodwill. John Adams chooses this moment to loudly proclaim his distrust of the French. I will be buried in the ocean before I voluntarily put our country into French chains, just as I'm struggling to throw off those of Great Britain? Adams goes so far as to send Vergen unsolicited advice on how France should be conducting the war. Mr. Adams, when I gave you a mark of my confidence by informing you about the movement of French fleets, I really didn't expect, as thanks, a list of criticisms of our strategy. To avoid further discussions of this sort, I now inform you that in the future I will be dealing only with Mr. Franklin on all matters that concern the King and the United States. I also remind you that the King does not require any further advice from you in these affairs. Comte de Vergen, I wish to make it clear that Mr. Adams's indiscretion is entirely his own. I live on terms of civility with him not intimacy. Relations broke down between Vergen and Adams so dramatically in 1780 that Vergen sent Franklin copies of all Adams's letters to him, which was a very uh, unusual and desperate move to take. He said to Franklin, I would like you to show these to the American Congress and have Adams recalled. Mr. Adams has offended the court here with several letters he has written. He did not show them to me before he sent them. He is creating suspicions that are endangering our support and our friendship with France. He imagines that Count Vergen and myself are continually plotting against him, that we are planting articles in the newspapers to belittle his character and other such fancies. I am persuaded that he means well for the country, that he is an honest man and a wise man. But in some things, he is absolutely out of his senses. Congress sends Adams to Holland to try to extract a loan from the Dutch. Arthur Lee had been recalled the year before. Franklin is relieved to be rid of his troublesome colleagues but the full weight of the mission now rests on his shoulders alone. Winter 1780. Franklin is working day and night, trying to assemble shipments of weapons and supplies. To pay for them, he is signing numerous loan certificates to the French government worthless because America is bankrupt. The French treasury is stretched to its limits. Vergen has hinted to Franklin that France is considering peace negotiations with England. Back in America, certain members of Congress are losing confidence in Franklin's ability to get results. The French Navy is still in the Caribbean, and though the French have sent an army to America, it is sitting idle in Rhode Island, waiting for reinforcements. Congress is blaming Franklin for France's inaction, and there is serious talk of replacing him. He makes a preemptive strike. To the President of Congress, I am now past 75 years old. I have just had another severe fit of the gout which has shaken me, and I have yet to recover my physical strength. I'm finding that the business is too heavy for me, and I fear that the affairs of the country are beginning to suffer. I've been engaged in public affairs, and I've enjoyed public confidence for 50 long years now. I have no other ambition left but to get some rest. I hope that Congress will grant me one last request, to send some person to France to replace me. Congress doesn't dare call Franklin's bluff. 
They insist that he stay on. And Franklin admits in a later letter to a friend that he regards that reappointment as more important than his first appointment because his enemies in Congress wanted his replacement. And even with their demanding it and his supporting it in a letter, they don't do it. They want him there. They need him. One night in November of 1781, Franklin and his friend Elkanah Watson stay up late talking about the war. They have news from America that the French army and navy are finally on the move, attempting a highly difficult military campaign. Because it takes over a month for news to cross the Atlantic, they have no idea how the plan has turned out. We talked that night only about the great combined military operation to take Cornwallis in Virginia. All evening long, we pored over the maps and weighed all the possibilities. Franklin was suspended between hope and fear. One moment he would be in gloomy despondency, and then, looking at the situation in another way, he would flash into a conviction of complete success. And when this 75-year-old man became exhilarated, his whole body assumed a state of elasticity, of active play. I didn't share his optimism. Went home around 11 o'clock, saddened over the fate of my country. One hour later, at midnight, a messenger arrives at Passy with startling news. The French and American armies and the French Navy have surrounded and taken the entire British army at Yorktown. Washington could never have won at Yorktown. He didn't know how to lay down a, a siege. He, he was a, a militia colonel. Uh, he, he learned a lot during his eight years of fighting, but the French army and the French participation and the French naval isolation of Cornwallis was absolutely crucial. It is an American victory. It is a French victory. And it is a victory for Benjamin Franklin's diplomacy. Mon cher papa, do you know why your neighbor has not written to you in a while? Because I am sulking. Yes, Monsieur Papa, I am sulking because of you. Here you take entire armies in America, and we, your poor neighbors, have to read about it in the newspaper. We were getting drunk drinking to your health, to that of Washington, to Independence, to the King, to Lafayette, and not one word from you. So I'm left only to imagine that you must be overjoyed. You must suddenly have become 20 years younger upon hearing the news. And you will lead us to lasting peace after this glorious victory. I, I will continue to talk until I hear from you. To Madame Brion, my dear friend. It was a great victory, but I am not celebrating yet. War is a very uncertain thing. I play this game exactly like you've seen me play play chess. I do not assume victory until the last move is made. Despite the British defeat at Yorktown, the war is not yet over. Hardliners in Parliament are still not willing to give up. Franklin decides to jumpstart negotiations. Nine years earlier in England, he had amazed some friends with his trick of pouring oil on rough waters. The demonstration took place on the estate of the Earl of Shelburne. Franklin knows that Shelburne is sympathetic to the American cause. Perhaps the old conjurer will once again be able to smooth troubled waters. Lord Shelburne, I assure you of my total respect for your talents and virtue. I'm sure your lordship, along with all good men, desires a general peace. For my own part, I shall, to my dying breath, contribute everything in my power to this end. Franklin's timing is exquisite. Opposition to the war has just brought down the British government. Franklin's old friend Shelburne is now Secretary of State and soon will be Prime Minister. This back-channel diplomacy has succeeded in laying the foundations for a peace treaty. But Franklin will not remain the sole negotiator. 
Congress has appointed two other men to work on the Peace Commission. First, John Jay arrives. A wealthy New Yorker and former president of Congress, he hates France almost more than he hates England. As for the third American commissioner, Count Vergen groans when he hears the name. John Adams. He has a rigidity, an arrogance, and an obstinacy which will drive the negotiators to despair. The stakes are high. All three commissioners know that in the treaty negotiations, everything is on the table. The very borders of the United States have to be determined. Even independence itself may be sacrificed to the wider aims of the large European powers. The French had their own issues. They wanted to retrieve some of the losses from the last war with Britain. The Spanish had their own issues. They wanted to get Gibraltar back. From Franklin's perspective in Paris, things only got more complicated because the United States was now immersed in the diplomacy among the major European powers. Shelburne sends an envoy to the American. If he can get them to sign a treaty directly with England, England will be in a much stronger negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the French. Franklin at first resists the idea of cutting the French out of the negotiating process. The true political interests of America consist in observing with complete exactitude the commitments we made to France. It is our connection with France which gives us weight with England and respect throughout Europe. If we were to break with France, England would again trample us and every other nation would despise us. I told him that the only treaty America would sign was one in concert with France. Jay and Adams are not convinced. They both believe that Franklin is in the pocket of the French. Jay particularly does not trust Vergen and believes that he is stalling on the peace in order to get the best deal for the French. The French court chooses to delay an acceptance of our independence by England until they make peace with England. They wish to keep us under their control until they get what they want from the peace. Count Vergen still calls us colonies and would have us only deal with the British through him. Behind Franklin's back, Jay and Adams determine to accept the British proposal and sideline France. Adams confronts Franklin. I told Franklin that I supported Jay's principles and firmness. To share details of the treaty with the French would be like committing the lamb to the custody of the wolf. I supported the idea of a separate treaty without reserve. Franklin has spent his six years in France building up a bond of trust with Vergen. Troubled by the belligerent tactics of his two younger colleagues, he debates what to do. Honor the terms of the original alliance, or go behind Vergen's back, betray France, and agree to a separate treaty with England. Franklin understood grateful as he was to the French and appreciative as he was for their help and honorable as everyone had been that he'd better get for America what he could get without waiting to follow the French lead. Franklin makes the difficult decision to go along with Jay and Adams. The master chess player sees that the young United States is in a strong position. Shelburne is so anxious to damage the French-American alliance that he is willing to give the Americans almost everything they are asking for. Vergen discovers that he has been double-crossed. I'm astonished. The British seem to buy peace rather than make it. The treaty is like a dream for the Americans, exceeding everything I should have thought possible. Our position in negotiating with Lord Shelburne has been seriously compromised. We knew nothing of the details, which were completed in the most sudden, unforeseen, and I may say, extraordinary manner. Franklin's letter to Vergen is a classic of diplomatic history. I can assure your excellency that nothing in this agreement is contrary to the interests of France. But you are correct in saying that we should have consulted you before we signed it. It was an error of propriety, not want of respect for the king, whom we all love and honor. 
I've just learned that the English flatter themselves in thinking that they have succeeded in dividing France and America. I hope this little misunderstanding between us will be kept secret so that they will find themselves totally mistaken. It's a masterpiece of diplomatic effrontery. He ends the letter by asking for more money. I accuse no one. I do not blame even Mr. Franklin. He yielded perhaps too easily to the impulses of his colleagues who affect to ignore the rules of courtesy. If we can judge the future by what we have just seen, we shall be poorly repaid for what we have done for the United States of America. You have to give credit to all three of them. I think both the British and the French thought that this was going to be easy going. The French thought they would take what they wanted, and the English thought that they could put one over on the Americans. They might get independence recognized, but they weren't going to get much else. And both the English and the French admitted that these fellows had performed a heck of a lot better than anyone expected them to. The Treaty of Paris was uh, a, a marvelous uh, achievement in many, many ways. For instance, uh, at one point, uh, uh, some of Franklin's fellow diplomats were ready to uh, give away the right to navigate the Mississippi, which Franklin, with this marvelous vision of the future, saw would be essential once Americans populated the Northwest. And Franklin said, I'd soon as give away the Mississippi as I'd give away my back door. What Franklin understood was that the United States needed to have territory to expand into. And that was the greatest achievement of the peace treaty that he got with the British government. The expansion of American boundaries from the Atlantic clear to the Mississippi River. The Treaty of Paris really guaranteed the American future. It's in the same league as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. It was that important. On September 3rd, 1783, Nearly two years after the victory at Yorktown, the final treaty is signed and all hostilities cease. Parisians celebrate the peace with fireworks in front of City Hall. Though Franklin has had many triumphs in his long life, this latest one is the greatest of them all. In 1785, Congress appoints Thomas Jefferson as the new ambassador to France and agrees to let Franklin retire. Madame Brion, the brilliant, is too distraught to see her old friend off. At the age of 79, Benjamin Franklin sails home to America. In many ways, his final years will be the happiest of his life. During his long stay in France, he has had little time for science. Now, on the voyage home, he organizes decades of thinking and experimentation. In three major scientific papers, he describes his latest theories on everything from the Gulf Stream to how to make ships unsinkable. Philadelphia is now a thriving city the capital of the new country. Much of its prominence is due to the many institutions, the library, the hospital, the college, that Franklin himself had helped found. He settles into the house near Market Street that he and his late wife, Deborah, had built two decades earlier. His daughter, Sally, and his six grandchildren are nearby. The increasing infirmities of old age become one more occasion for scientific inquiry. I have found that deafness will considerably diminish one's pleasure in conversation. But it is easily remedied by putting your hand behind your ear and pressing it outward with the hollow of your hand. I did an experiment and I found that I could hear the tick of a watch 
45 feet away using this method. Franklin's health is deteriorating, but not his sense of humor. He suggests that the predatory eagle is not the right symbol for the fledgling country. In its stead, he proposes a useful bird, the turkey. In compensation for all his services to his country, Franklin has asked Congress for two things, a grant of land in the West and a job for one of his grandchildren. Congress gives him nothing, not even his expenses for his years in France. It's sort of inexplicable that after all Franklin had done, uh, he was not greeted with laurel wreath and flower petal strewn. I think some of it is because America had found its hero in George Washington. If you immortalize Washington, you say, the Americans who starved at Valley Forge triumphed because God was on our side, truth and justice were on our side. If you immortalize Franklin, then you say, we couldn't have done it without France. And so when you pick your heroes to revere, you're also picking the myth about yourself that you want to tell. At a time of life when most people become more conservative, Franklin is becoming more radical. Never one to accept the status quo, he takes a public stand against a fundamental institution of American society, slavery. Can the pleasure of sweetening our tea with sugar grown by slaves make up for all the misery produced among our fellow creatures? The butchery of the human species by this detestable traffic in the bodies and souls of men. As a young man, Franklin accepted slavery as just the way the world worked. He owned a couple of personal servants himself. He engaged in buying and selling slaves through his various business enterprises. And he unthinkingly accepted the assumption that Africans were inferior in intelligence to Europeans. This assumption was challenged when he visited a school where young black children were being educated. And he discovered that these children, these African-American children, were learning just as quickly as white kids of the same age. He changed his whole theory and was willing to go exactly the opposite direction, to uh, encourage their education and also to argue for the end of slavery, and became, uh, in, his, in the final years of his life, uh, a great radical on that issue. In 1787, Franklin accepts the presidency of America's first abolitionist society. He is the only one of the founding fathers to actively campaign against slavery. That summer in Philadelphia, Delegates from the separate states gathered to write a constitution for the new country. Franklin, old and sick, has to be carried to the convention hall. The debates are long and rancorous, and the final document is highly controversial. The delegates know that most Americans are still passionately attached to states' rights. Many regard the Constitution as threatening the freedoms men have fought and died for. James Madison is deeply disillusioned with the final results because some of his pet things are, are omitted. And he writes a letter to Jefferson which says, I don't think it's going to work. And Washington is reputed to have said, this thing won't last 20 years. Everybody knew that this document, which was a radical proposal, was going to have a very difficult time getting ratified. And there was hardly a member of the convention that approved of the whole thing. It was a bundle of compromises. Nobody got exactly what they wanted, and many were very suspicious of the document. Franklin ends the convention with a seemingly simple speech. In it, he draws on a lifetime of skills as a diplomat and negotiator. 
No ringing phrases or calls to battle, but rather a plea for compromise. This is his last public statement, and perhaps his greatest. I don't entirely approve of this constitution at present. I'm not sure I'll ever approve of it, but I'm also not sure I'm right. I've lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more I begin to doubt my own infallibility, the more I begin to respect the judgment of others. We've collected together men who not only have great wisdom, but also prejudices, selfish views, and local interests. From such an assembly, we can't expect a perfect production. It astonishes me that we have come as close to perfection as we did. It will astonish our enemies, who think of our separate states coming together only to cut each other's throats. So I consent to this constitution because I expect no better. And because I'm not absolutely convinced that it is not the best. Nobody, including Franklin, expected the Constitution to last for 200 years. They saw it as an experiment, as a, a try at solving the problem of a central intensive government for a series of states. What he was pleading for was ratification so the experiment could be run. In some ways, the federal Constitution was the end and the most important experiment to which Franklin was committed in a life in which he made his name as an experimentalist. Franklin signs the document with the flourished signature of his youth. He is the only person to have his name on the three documents that created this country. The Declaration of Independence, the Peace Treaty with England, and the United States Constitution. In 1790, at the age of 84, Benjamin Franklin dies at home. 20,000 people attend his funeral. Not only the high and the mighty, but the ordinary tradesmen from whose ranks he had risen. When news of his death reaches France, that country is in the throes of its own revolution. King Louis will soon be overthrown, in part because he bankrupted France with his support of the American War. The French Assembly immediately announces an official countrywide period of mourning. Benjamin Franklin, the man of humble roots who had snatched lightning from the gods and the scepter from tyrants, is for the French a symbol of the new order they hope to establish. For Americans, Franklin's legacy would be much more complex. In the century following his death, he was mythologized as the patron saint of success through hard work and diligence. Franklin's autobiography led Mark Twain to complain that Franklin was the author of a vicious conspiracy against every boy growing up in America. Because that boy's father could point to the autobiography and said, young Ben was able to do this at age so-and-so, and you, you lout, are incapable of it. There's an important and highly significant fact that Franklin suppresses from the autobiography. He never tells you that he's a genius. In our own time, the magnitude of Franklin's achievements continues to astonish. After 782 pages, his biographer Carl Van Doren gave up trying to sum him up. He wrote that Franklin seemed to be not one person, but a harmonious human multitude. Well, I often say, you know, that when we look for Ben Franklin's legacy, we don't have to look far. Because each and every one of us is Ben Franklin's living legacy. And I think he'd come back and he'd look at the street lights and the paved streets and the fire companies and the schools, and he would see himself and his ideas and hope for us reflected in all those things. The real distinction between Franklin and the rest of the founding fathers 
was that Franklin takes great pride in being a tradesman. And he believes that the foundation of American democracy is not some elite, not some aristocracy, but the middle class shopkeeper who's learned, who cares about civic life, and can participate in democracy. I think what Franklin demonstrates is the importance of intellectual flexibility. He was profoundly interested in issues and was willing to change his convictions according to observations. Let the experiment be made. That was his philosophy. Franklin was born at a time when witches were thought to be real, and he died at the dawn of the modern age. It is an age that, to a surprising degree, he himself helped shape. He came from a society where class determined one's station in life, and he helped create a country where merit and ability could flourish. In a rigid world of orthodoxy and dogma, he believed to the core of his soul in the virtues of tolerance and compromise. The quintessential optimist, he never doubted, even for a moment, that the future of humanity lay in the infinite power of human reason. The rapid progress of the sciences makes me, at times, sorry that I was born so soon. Imagine the power that man will have over matter a few hundred years from now. We may learn how to remove gravity from large masses and float them over great distances. Agriculture will double its produce with less labor. All diseases will surely be cured, <laughs> even old age. If only the moral sciences could be improved as well, perhaps men would cease to be wolves to one another, and human beings could learn to be human. Explore the amazing life of Benjamin Franklin at PBS Online. Recreate famous experiments. Sample Ben's wit and wisdom, and discover how his ideas shape our world. Log on to pbs.org. Major funding for Benjamin Franklin is provided by the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. The people of Northwestern Mutual are proud to have supported this remarkable series on PBS, celebrating the wisdom and ingenuity of one of America's most distinguished founding fathers. Major funding is also provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding America's understanding of who we were, who we are, and who we will be. The Pew Charitable Trusts, investing in ideas, returning results. Additional funding is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for Public Understanding of Science and Technology, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, by these funders, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.